Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tomasz Stepniewski and I'm Deputy Director at the Institute of Central Europe. I also have the pleasure to act as a Chairman of the Lublin Central Europe Forum. This year's theme of the conference is Central Europe, a shift in the security paradigm. Yesterday, we had a debate on Russia's aggression against Ukraine, consequences for international order and security, moderated by Professor Beata Surmac, the director of the Institute of Central Europe, and Professor Marek Pietrasz from the University of Maria curie Skłodowska uh, in Lublin. Now, we shall move on to our second panel. This time, the focus will be on NATO, back to the roots. Our panelists represent the International Institute for Strategic Studies from the United Kingdom and Germany, permanent delegation of the Republic of Poland to NATO, Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian PRISM in Ukraine, and the Center for National Security and Defense Research at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. This panel will be moderated by Jakub Olchowski and Professor Konrad Pawłowski, both from the Institute of Central Europe. Without further ado, I give the floor to the moderators, Jakub and Konrad, and I'm looking forward to an exciting discussion. Thank you. So, um, uh, hello everyone. Um, uh, good morning. Um, welcome to our to our panel. And let's not waste time, I think, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's get to, 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 to the questions, because our panel is entitled NATO Back the Roots. So uh, we will try to discuss uh, shortly, of course, about, uh, about NATO and about its role in changing, in a changing reality, in, uh, in a changing international security architecture, because, uh, of course, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was established as a collective defense system of, of the West, but it was more than 70 years ago, and everything has changed since then. International security uh, system, international order, um, geopolitical uh, situation, everything has changed. The world has changed. So the question is, and the NATO itself, had to change, had to find a new identity, a new role, and a new position and role, etc. Et so the question is, 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 really, um, is, is NATO getting back to its original role as a collective, uh, as a collective system, uh, uh, as a collective defense system? Is it possible now? Is it possible in this uh, changed reality is it possible if we look at uh, at today's nato it's not 12 countries it's not it's not 12 member states it's it will be probably very soon uh, 32 member states it's a completely different situation and of course uh, is it going to be a collective defense system in the context of central and eastern europe or as one prefers uh, the eastern flank so um, perhaps we'll start with, uh, uh, with uh, Ms. Hanna Shalast, who represents an outstanding Ukrainian think tank, the Ukrainian PRISM. But as I understand, Hanna is now uh, in the United States uh, of America at the moment. So, um, so please, Hanna, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation organizing this uh, panel. You know, the question is really very relevant uh, because uh, security has been changing within uh, the last 70 years significantly. And uh, what we talked and mean under the name of security back in 1950s is absolutely not the same what we've been talking even the last five years or 10 years when we started to talk much more about terrorism, energy, migration, climate as the security challenges. We started to speak about so-called hybrid threats. And uh, because of this, it's been a little bit of deterioration, let's say, a little bit of the diffusion sometimes of the meaning of security, of the classical meaning of security. And uh, uh, as 
Because in 2014, I remember the phrase that I heard from the NATO officials, oh, you save our summit. We now know about what to talk. And unfortunately, that know what to talk was the uh, uh, annexation of Crimea. So the same is happening uh, in 2022. Uh, the last uh, 80 plus days uh, and of the brutal Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, changed this perception of security again, because many countries that even for the last eight years were reluctant to accept that the old real politics of the uh, Cold War returned back, it is now here. The war is again in the mid of Europe, and NATO is definitely is expected to react as much as possible. What is interesting that originally the European Union that we usually criticize as the security actor, talking that they're not able to be a security actor yet, became much more um, uh, vocal uh, than NATO. And as for me, the very first weeks of the NATO strategic communications were quite weak and unsuccessful. And even, uh, um, it's not mistakenly, but that uh, really had a certain damage, especially when you speak about the Eastern flank and partner countries. Because NATO talked a lot about what they can't do. They were not talking what they have already done for Ukraine and the fact that the fact that Ukrainian army were able to fight that strong against Russia is because of all those reforms that we did according to the NATO standards within the last eight years. Then they didn't talk about what they are doing, uh, meaning how all national states, member states been helping Ukraine with the weapons, with intelligence exchange, with the different other ways. And they didn't talk originally that their primary goal is to defend the member states. That's why definitely their efforts should be, first of all, concentrated on the securing own borders. And uh, only probably after the summit in the end of March, we started to hear the different uh, rhetoric that returned back NATO to uh, not even to the agenda, but to the uh, front page, to the, the scene. And that is the question for me. Uh, why this happened? Was it the, just the mistakes of the of the communication team, or, or was it the a little bit uh, gap between the perception of security that I talked that it changed, the more attention started to be paid to um, other issues than the classical security. And that's why it, it was a shock and not readiness to um, react. Or was it just because NATO been just in the process of drafting the new strategic concept and it already looked that countries more or less know what will be there. And then suddenly the situation is significantly changing. So they needed a certain... Uh, psychological period of uh, uh, transformation inside of them and understanding that uh, uh, it's not NATO back, but the old problems back. And that probably um, NATO now should both return to the roots of why it's been created, but at the same time understand the tools, methods, threats, uh, challenges, they evaluated. And you cannot act with the same uh, uh, message that you had in 1949 against the threats that you have now. And that is not only about the uh, uh, identification of the uh, like how to behave with Finland and Sweden, the neutral states, because the neutrality now is very uh, vague uh, um, uh, or constant. But at the same time, uh, it's definitely, as you said, it's not 12 member states. And you see that even when you have such a serious threat as the Russian aggression, there are still certain countries who had quite a strong economic interest, for example, or personal interest. And uh, it's uh, much more difficult to break these ties uh, than uh, it's been in 1949 when these ties uh, didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely right. This was, I think it was very correct remark that uh, things change and uh, even if NATO wants to be a collective defense system, it needs uh, uh, quite another toolbox than, uh, than in 1949 and then in the, in the era of, uh, of, the, of the Cold War. Um, uh, that's correct. And what is also important, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, 12 states and versus 30 or 32 member states. And that's the problem that uh, in, in case of all international institutions or all international organizations, the larger organization, the more difficult it is uh, to manage and to find a consensus and the common interest. Uh, and we can see that, unfortunately, even in the case, uh, even, if, even in the case of, uh, uh, of NATO. Um, thank you very much, Hannah. And, um, maybe um, Mr. William Alberkew in Berlin, from Berlin. 
What about you and what about your opinion? Right. So when I when I look at the question about NATO getting back to its original role, um, it, it, it's interesting. I when I came into NATO it was 2012, and it seemed like the end of things was coming as we moved out of the Chicago summit towards the Wales summit. There was a lot of talk that we had solved Afghanistan check, and now we were going to move into a period of exercises, maybe to keep NATO alive. We were looking at humanitarian voluntary out of area operations rather than the core mission of nato and this kind of drew, drove me crazy because when i went to nato i was all about collective security i wanted to see us better defend the alliance and as the director of arms control uh, the tool of arms control itself was being used against nato uh, to harm our interests to uh, push us into a position of disarmament rather than what we really needed which i thought was to stand up to an increasingly revisionist russia um and so yes as our previous speaker said uh unfortunately putin's invasion of ukraine um transformed the summit process and I remember I was giving a briefing that had been given to me by another division and it showed the history of NATO and it showed collective security was up here and humanitarian operations were down here. And then starting in the 90s, uh, that shifted. And the question was, was, was this going to shift back? Uh, obviously by 2014, the answer was absolutely yes. And we went through a series of exercises to see how NATO would defend itself in this new context. And the answer was not very encouraging. We did a series of large scale exercises uh, with headquarters to try to demonstrate that the tools that we had in 2014 were wholly inadequate, even for the mildest of Russian uh, incursion scenarios. And, you know, the first idea was we would take the NATO response force and we would have a spearhead, the very ready joint task force, the VJTF, which would be ready within 48 hours or 72 hours to put a couple thousand troops into an area. And the very first exercise we had where we tried to test this concept, allies said, well, can we send it to two places at once? The answer was no. Can we send it under fire? No. How long do you think it would hold against a Russian attack? A couple hours, maybe. So that was considered completely inadequate. And then the question was, how do we get forces forward? The NATO force integration units, so a permanent presence that helps to plan for exercises, that was one of the ideas. Uh, and we put that into a number of the Eastern allies to be able to permanently plan for exercises for how they would receive troops and how they would logistically link up with local forces. But then of course, the enhanced forward presence a battalion sized fighting force made up of at the time when we first launched it, it was 22 different allies, but key to that was the U S the UK and France as part of these battalions, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland, each receiving an EFP force still too small to really fight and win. And so again, through exercising, we realized that hmm, is good to have a tripwire. You force Russia into an attack where they have to, attack the three nuclear members of NATO. And you have to remember, this is exactly the choice that the Soviet Union had back in the Cold War. We never thought that we could defend West Berlin, but we had the uh, US, the UK and France had forces there so that when the Soviet Union attacked, they would be directly engaging the three nuclear powers of NATO. We couldn't defend West Berlin, but those troops would die and thus we would have full war with the NATO nuclear states. Unity would be achieved and we'd be able to defend Germany. Um, and so similarly, the EFP provides that tripwire. As we've seen from Ukraine though, the idea that we're going to have a tripwire and that Russian forces are gonna pull into our territory and then we're gonna to have to force them out has become, shall we say, rather unpalatable. What they're going to do in the meantime, even with two weeks, which is just too horrifying to consider. In the meantime at NATO, they've been already thinking about the idea of forward defense so instead of a tripwire and then defense in depth to actually fight and defeat the Russians at the front line so they never take your territory. This debate also occurred throughout the Cold War. Would we fight the Soviets, let them in and destroy them? Or would we fight them right on the front line? Now in the Cold War, the Soviets had so many forces that that would have required a large number of nuclear weapons. Hence, our nuclear posture in the Cold War was to have 
thousands, at one point, 6,000 nuclear weapons were deployed to destroy the Soviet forces before they could cross into West Germany. Of course, this was going to be a little bit of a mess for Germany. Both West and East Germany would be completely annihilated in the first few days of war between the Soviet Union and NATO, but we wouldn't have to push the Soviets out of territory that they'd already taken. Sort of a Pyrrhic victory. That's sort of where we left it in the Cold War. Now, we really can defend that forward line. It was a little bit more complicated before, but with Sweden and Finland in the alliance, the chances of Russian success in the Baltics drops considerably because now the Russians have to think about fires coming from Finnish territory and missile strikes coming from Swedish territory, annihilating the Russian Baltic fleet, destroying their aircraft as they take off, and even with the HIMARS artillery system from Finland, being able to strike into the Russian rear area to destroy their conventional forces, their logistics, their transportation, before they can even make it into the Baltics. So now as we shift to this idea for defense, but this time with more credible forces, I think we're going to need permanent stationed NATO forces in the Baltics and Poland in order to fight the best battle possible. And I think also probably in Slovakia as well, because Belarus we have to consider is now completely compromised and Russian permanent forces will probably uh, survive the Ukraine war in Belarus. There will probably also in the longer term when Belarus is fully merged into Russia, which I think will happen, uh, the chance that Russia will station nuclear weapons in Belarus as well, which complicates our central European stance, again, requiring more NATO basing. Now, people have said the substantial combat forces pledge that's in the NATO-Russia founding act limits us in terms of conventional forces. And that's true to an extent. We can only put up to a heavy brigade in each uh, NATO ally. Uh, I would be happy with a, with a brigade in each NATO ally. That's fine. And that wouldn't violate the NATO-Russia founding act. But the fact is, we have to tear up the NATO-Russia founding act. We have to throw it away. We have to renounce the substantial combat forces pledge. We have to renounce the three no's. And we have to look at any type of basing option that we think, as we go through the process of MC400 revision, the military strategy for the defense of the alliance, and the enactment of the deterrence and defense posture of the Atlantic area, the DDA, we have to think more boldly in terms of basing. And I think these need to be accompanied posts. So families of the allies who put permanent forces in the East buy into the culture, they understand the place that they're living, and they become advocates within the United States, within the UK, within Canada for for our wonderful Eastern European friends. It worked in the Cold War with the permanent basing in NATO by the United States, UK, Canada. I think it can work again for the Baltic security. So we are going back to basics, but it's in a different environment with a different threat and a different posture. We'll have to think more comprehensively about how to defeat the Russians before they cross into NATO territory. And I think with Sweden, Finland and the alliance, with forward basing options, flexible options, and perhaps even some new nuclear options in terms of air launch cruise missiles rather than the B-61, I think we can fight and we can win. And in fact, we can deter Russia from ever trying. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. That's an interesting view. And um, uh, you know, you are, in, uh, you are in Berlin now, in Germany. And uh, well, uh, I have a feeling that uh, some German politicians uh, would not agree with many things that you just said, especially about this permanent uh, presence of NATO forces, for example, in the Baltic, uh, in the Baltic region. Uh, uh, one more thing, um, because you also said about um, this confrontation, poss a possible confrontation between the, uh, in the past between the Soviet Union and uh, and NATO. In such a case, the very first country that would be destroyed and burned to the ground would be Poland, not East Germany. So, uh, and we, we keep it in mind uh, also in, in Poland when we think about uh, uh, Russia, uh, uh, even uh, even even today, uh, of course. Um, Okay, uh, so now let's move perhaps to um, uh, to Sofia, uh, to to Bulgaria, because I hope it will be uh, perhaps another uh, another perspective, uh, um, perhaps a bit different, or, or perhaps not. Uh, please, Mr. Martin Sokol. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon from uh, me. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, I'm going to say that uh, objectively. NATO has always, uh, at a certain level, been back to its basics. Of course, there was a, a certain identity crisis uh, in the early 2000s, and uh, you no, know, the need to refocus on the original goals was, of course, uh, 
reinvigorated with um, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea back in back in 2014. Um, and yes, it will be absolutely necessary for uh, NATO to enhance its presence uh, and for the different member states to modernize their own militaries and enhance uh, security ties. But there's going to be a bit of a different role for uh, NATO in the coming years, uh, I would say. And I've, I'm going to be a bit uh, provocative because it's a bit of a risk of what I'm going to put forward as a thesis. Because even and during the Cold War, the idea was to stop the Soviets of uh, ever going into, as was stated in uh, East Berlin or uh, other forms of uh, adventurism. Uh, since 2014, uh, Russia has objectively uh, burned its bridges and a lot of its uh, leverages is a possibility to you know, gain a more prominent and aggressive role through uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, of course, there is a threat, and of course, uh, the forward presence uh, is required. But I, I think that uh, the risk we're looking at in the next mid to long term, so five to ten years, is n not as much a spillover right now of the uh, conflict in Ukraine to NATO member states. Yes, there is a threat, of it, but a far greater threat I think that's going, it's likely to happen, is actually to have a uh, spillover effect, but back into Moscow's uh, own zone. Now, of of course, the primary example of these uh, of this are uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan. Now, in, in the past two years, there was uh, quite there were quite popular protests, which were, to say it explicitly, not pro Western, not pro US or pro EU or pro NATO. They were anti corruption. However, with Russia's involvement in uh, stopping uh, the protests and basically uh, quashing opposition leaders and figures in Kazakhstan and Belarus, what they done is equate with this, uh, themselves with. Uh, with the local corruption there. So it's uh, very possible that now, uh, because there have been no objective reforms in these countries, uh, uh, it's very possible that uh, there will be renewed protests uh, in uh, uh, these states uh, with the idea for anti-corruption reform, for enhancing the rule of law. And it's going to be very tricky depending on how Russia responds, how people there will respond uh, regarding long-term uh, Russian influence. Additionally, let's not forget that you no, know, we talk often talk about Russia with the idea that it's an incredible monolith and there's this total uh, control of power. But Russia is the federation of uh, uh, twenty something uh, republics, and uh, I have to check how many uh, zones and regions with a special a special status um, in the federation. Uh, so there's a lot of room for domestic challenges, which were further exacerbated uh, since Putin's uh, coming to power. Because, of course, let's be, uh, let's say it, in the, ni the 90s, they were very turbulent for Russia. So Putin did a great job from a Russian perspective initially to stop organized crime and to stop separate tensions, like in Chechnya. However, he did so with the easiest possible way, which was centralizing power and demolishing all possible opposition. The problem with this strategy over the long run is basically that you have nobody to take your place, be it from the opposition or your own party, because he has, again, destroyed that. And it, it, this, this heavy level of, fed of um, centralization over such a vast territory with the different uh, republics and zones does have the potential to bring uh, to bring up internal, internal conflicts uh, over a longer period of time. Let's not forget that the war in Chechnya and it only in uh, 2009. So one of NATO's tasks, I would say, is be, uh, being careful of how it's going to uh, deal with Russia, not as much as it coming towards Central and Western Europe or Eastern Europe, but about how it's going to manage and uh, not break it. A very strong uh, NATO response, uh, overly um, aggressive, so to speak, does have uh, the capacity and over a certain, certain period of time to break Russia. Let's, again, let's be honest, Russia is an extremely uh, fragile uh, state over a longer uh, period of time. But not to focus too much on that, just a few remarks of um, another thing that NATO is going to uh, be dealing with heavily in the next 10 years, uh, which was not uh, initially expected, and that will be migrations towards uh, Europe. Because we're looking, I would say, at uh, three big uh, migration waves which are directly correlated with Russia's uh, renewed invasion in Ukraine. One is, of course, uh, Ukrainian refugees who are fleeing from the war. 
The second, uh, because of uh, the seed blockades uh, of Ukraine and the fact that both Ukraine and Russia are the big, biggest exporters of wheat, that uh, is detrimental to food security uh, to uh, fragile states, particularly in the, the Middle East and North Africa. So it is uh, quite possible that conflicts there could be exacerbated, which would fuel again um, uh, migration crisis. And uh, the third possible source of a uh, of very uh, uh, strong migrant influence would be from Russia itself. Right now we're looking that a lot of uh, people are already fleeing uh, from Russia itself because they have a sense of this uh, fragility of the state. Uh, already according to some estimates there are over a million people since the beginning of this year and if my other hypothesis uh, thesis sorry that uh, not uh, very bright prospects of with Russia domestically we could deal with a third uh, with a third uh, uh, big, uh, big wave. So NATO is going to be, uh, it's going to have to adapt quickly on the spot and be prepared for tasks that are not uh, explicitly under, uh, you know, uh, under its jurisdiction, so to speak. From Sofia, this is uh, for now on this question. Mm, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, but it's, I think it's obvious if you don't adapt to reality, you die. This is a, a, a simple, a simple uh, right of uh, the simple law of the evolution. Uh, one more, one thing about Russia, because uh, you said a very interesting thing about um, Russia and its internal problems. Um, uh, uh, well, we are uh, we are fed, in fact, by our media and European Western media that are. Uh, 70 or 80 percent Russians support the war or oh, special military operation. But it's, uh, it's a simplification because uh, the Russian sociologi sociological research shows that uh, there are many different groups and there are many different kinds of supporters. Because some of them just believe uh, TV propaganda and the Russian propaganda is, is great, it's, it's really effective, we know that. Some of them are supporters of uh, 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 Ruski Mir concept. Some of them, uh, uh, some of them are, are actually wouldn't like this war to, to continue, but, well, this is typically, typically um, Russian or, or even Soviet thinking, uh, you know, homo sovieticus. If the authorities say to do it, we have to do it, because it's certainly correct, uh, etc., etc. So... Uh, this, the, the picture of the Russian society is more complicated than uh, uh, we usually tend to think uh, in the West. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. And now, and it's not it's not a coincidence. Uh, uh, I'd like to, to to finish this turn of uh, of questions with uh, uh, Mr. Dominik Jankowski because he is in Brussels. He is in uh, in the center. He is in the uh, in the headquarters in the NATO headquarters. So, so, how does it look like from from the center, from the heart of NATO? Uh, th thanks, thanks, uh, and thank you for for the invitation. Well, I, uh, first of all, let me say I do believe that the heart of NATO is on the eastern flank right now. So um, the NATO headquarters is, is, is an important element of making the heart beating. Um, but but the true um, the true challenges and threats are are most visible uh, first of all in, in Ukraine, of course, but but then um, very much. Um, visible also on the entire eastern flank. So uh, let, let me say a few things. I, I, I must, uh, must admit I, I agree with my previous speakers on a lot of elements. So um, in order not to be repetitive, um, let me signal a few elements. First, uh, uh, Russia is, is the main imminent threat to not only Ukraine, of course, uh, but also to NATO allies. Um, and, and this is the reality. And this reality will stay with us um, for foreseeable future. I'm not going to guess how long. That's, um, um, I would certainly say, longer than months. Uh, we are talking about years. We are talking about long-term challenge uh, and direct threats. Um, but, but this is the basis for any future analysis and decision-making. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, and uh, William mentioned that also directly, uh, we are seeing, in fact, a... a, a a change of the Russian posture in Belarus. Um, this is this is a, a permanent change. 
um, uh, that will have direct implications, security and defense implications for the NATO instant, instant flank. And we have seen those implications directly um, uh, during the Russian um, uh, uh, unjustified aggression against uh, against uh, Ukraine. So, in fact, we are seeing more Russian troops um, on closer to the eastern flank. Um, uh, the Western military district has become a hub of transformation of the Russian armed forces. Um, we have seen the capabilities used by the Russian armed forces during the war. Um, I'm not going to go into assessing that at this stage, uh, but I think the display of capabilities um, is clear. Um, some will say, you know, um, Russia is is not going to uh, be um, as strong as it is forever. Um, I, I tend to disagree. I think Russia has been able um, uh, since 2014 to show that it's capable very quickly um, uh, to research uh, with, uh, with new capabilities, new ideas, new tactics, uh, in, and in different spheres. Which leads me to my third point. The NATO allies are in direct conflict with Russia in, in certain domains. There is a direct conflict with Russia in cyberspace. Um, we, we, of course, are, are not calling for Article 5, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't been happening. Uh, that Russia has has not weaponized cyberspace to such a degree that, of course, we we are um, we, we are in uh, directly challenged, uh, frankly, on a on a regular basis. The same goes for the famous hybrid warfare or hybrid campaigns, which are being directed not only, of course, against uh, Ukraine and our um, and our closest partners such as uh, Sweden and Finland, hopefully soon um, soon uh, members of this alliance, uh, but also against allies. So I think it's when you look at Russia, uh, you need to zoom out and look broadly at what Russia is doing. Which leads me to my uh, final point um, uh, on this um, on this first question is what we need to do. And I think William also um, at least alluded to some elements. Uh, William mentioned the NATO Russia Founding Act. NATO Russia Founding Act is that there, there is no single constraint coming from NATO Russia Founding Act that we will be uh, obliged to respect anymore, which basically means that we can change and adapt our posture, deterrence and defense posture on NATO's issue plan. That leads to, let's say, for, for the moment, to, to three main conclusions. First, this posture, this presence should be permanent. Um, permanent in a sense that we are talking about permanent basing um, of troops um, on, on the territory of uh, Eastern Allies, Poland, Baltic states, but of course we need to look also um, um, to the southeastern part of um, uh, of the of the flank, uh, including Romania and Bulgaria. Um, second element is the, the forces, the, the 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 combat forces that are currently being um, being deployed to the eastern flank, the enhanced forward presence. That's not enough. That that's the tripwire concept. So basically, that's that's the concept. We. we uh, we are going to defend ourselves um, to, to a degree, of course. Um, and, and this is probably most visible in the Baltic states. I think we need to change that concept from enhance uh, presence, uh, forward presence to forward defense. So basically come back to the core business, to the, well, some will say, you know, it's Cold War thinking. Uh, I, 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 I'm saying this is a realistic thinking about the level of threat and how to respond to that level of threat. If, if that's bringing us to the Cold War solutions, that's great. I mean, those solutions were functioning back in the past. So basically, I would say we'd need to increase the number of troops from the battalion size and henceforth presence to the brigade, at least uh, size in every single um, country on the eastern flank. Um, and then, of course, with proper firepower, which basically means capabilities being at the disposal um, 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 of, um, of those NATO forces. And that leads me to my final point, which is, of course, all in all, uh, we, we are and will be um, a transatlantic alliance. So nothing will happen and move without the presence of the United States on the European continent. The transatlantic element, the transatlantic bond, of course, there is a big discussion about U.S.-China relationship and how this will factor in. But I think the, the main purpose, at least for, for this summit and this strategic concept, is to recommit to that transatlantic um, bond, making sure that U.S. presence will remain, U.S. military presence will, will remain visible um, uh, on, uh, on, on European soil and on the eastern flank. Final point, and, and that's, that's uh, with that I would like to wrap up, um, is that 
we will still be a nuclear alliance. And we'll have to, and William was also um, referring to that, we'll have to most probably rethink our nuclear posture to some degree. Um, R Russia has, has uh, shown how it's using its very aggressive and coercive uh, nuclear rhetoric against um, Ukraine, but also against uh, allies. So all in all, I think we need to be uh, we need to be ready to have a proper discussion about that. Also, also at the NATO summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, so uh, so you say that the alliance evolves, and um, I remember uh, I remember, it, and you know the words of Lord Ismay, the first Secretary General, that the NATO was established to keep Americans in Europe and to keep Russians out of Europe, let alone the keeping Germans down. Okay, let's let's forget about it. Uh, maybe now, but everything evolves. Um, so um, I think that that's what the, the, uh, also William told about it, about this enhanced and permanent presence of, uh, of NATO forces in the eastern flank. By the way, uh, ironically, that's uh, the result of uh, Mr. Putin's actions. Uh, he didn't want NATO <laughs> to be uh, stronger and closer to Russia, and it will be uh, stronger, and it is stronger and closer to uh, to the Russian Federation, but um, um, well, perhaps we will have time later to to discuss this. But don't you think that um, uh, perhaps we will talk about it later? That uh, because I have been asked many times, um, why this uh, um, battalion groups in the eastern flank? Uh, uh, well, the, the, they are small units, relatively small units, not very uh, not very meaningful militarily. So uh, do they have uh, uh, really a military meaning? And I was uh, always answering, uh, it's not about the military in the case of these battalion groups, but it's about the politics. Because if you attack them, you attack NATO. And that, that, that's it. Uh, uh, and just like William said, uh, you attack nuclear members of, uh, of NATO, United States, France, or, or or Great, uh, or Great Britain, but yeah, that's right. Uh, in the, uh, in the current situation, when Russia actually uses uses military force, perhaps it it could be better to uh, to strengthen NATO forces and uh, uh, instead of battalion groups, perhaps brigades. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much. And before uh, before we move to 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 the other question, and before uh, my colleague uh, uh, will uh, will take the floor, uh, if I may, uh, uh, once w shortly, I'd like to conclude what you said because uh, perhaps it is. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's surprising, but uh, uh, actually, you you uh, uh, you agreed with each other because uh, the conclusion is uh, uh, is uh, uh, is is really optimistic. Uh, the, the, the conclusion of your um, uh, of your views is, is really optimistic because, in fact, you said that yes, NATO is a collective will be a collective defense system. Uh, of course, with the use of uh, other tools, other methods, and 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 etc. Et 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 and, and so on. Um, but it will be a collective defense system also in the context of the Eastern flank, which is perhaps not. Mm -hmm. There are some people who who don't believe that too much, especially in the eastern flank uh, uh, countries and in Ukraine, of, uh, of course. But well, we'll see. Perhaps we will we'll also have some time to to, to talk about it. And now, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, please, uh, Conrad. Um, time is yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So. Uh, the second question is uh, related to with, with the, the present uh, time and the future. Uh, the strategic concept is a key document for the alliance. Uh, at the Brussels summit in June well, uh, 2021, NATO leaders agreed that NATO will adopt its new strategic concept at the 2022 Madrid summit. But the recent strategic concept of NATO is already 20, 20 years old. The last strategic concept was adopted at the Lisbon summit in 2010. As we all know, uh, security architecture has dramatically changed since then. 
so the question occurs, is a new long-awaited NATO strategy able to face this process efficiently? To sum up, what we could expect from the new NATO's strategy concept in the age of disruption, the age we see today. And I would like to uh, ask this question, uh, I would like to uh, ask Ms. Hannah Schellers to start a uh, debate about, about that. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. You know, the Ukrainian expert community elaborated eight uh, uh, points uh, to the strategic concept that had been presented in uh, April. And we have a wonderful meeting with the uh, NATO officials discussing this because we preliminarily discussed in January with them how Ukraine and how partners in general see uh, what they would like to see in the new strategic concept. And in April, we already presented a text that is available online. It's public. And uh, um, we understood all the challenges, but we decided to uh, um, emphasize several of them. Uh, two are definitely uh, uh, quite a strategic philosophical, you can name it as you want, uh, that first of all, it should not be ambiguity about Russia in the new strategic concept. Because uh, originally, let's remember, we had all these phrases, I mean, not in the old strategic concept, let's forget about it. I mean, it's totally irrelevant uh, as for now. Uh, but the last summit, the last statement, you always have this deterrence and dialogue. Deterrence and dialogue. And uh, uh, theoretically, that is good, but practically it showed that Russia accepted it only as the weakness of the alliance. So we considered as the partners that finally we should not only name and blame, but clearly identify what is Russia and that you can cooperate with Russia only if Russian behavior is changing. So to make any uh, type of the uh, relations conditional. And one of the reasons is that uh, the Russian Federation have been manipulating perfectly the last eight years with the issues uh, like nuclear or strategic arms control uh, or Syria talking that, ah, you still need us. Maybe you will close eyes to some of our atrocities in Ukraine because you still uh, uh, need us. We can uh, make the situation in some other regions worse. So uh, that's probably now is exactly the time to, to stop such practice and to consider the new type of the relations and vision of the Russian Federation. The second is definitely the relations with partners, because the partnership for peace, as for now, is totally uh, outdated. It's been super in 1994, but as for now, it has 40 countries, neutral, non-neutral, aspirants, those uh, that are very far, those who are interested only in the reforms, and the certain diversification of partnership is needed. And connected with this is definitely the necessity to fill with the substance the enhanced opportunity partnership. Because these six countries received the status, we all know that it means increased cooperation, enhanced cooperation, better sharing of the information. But at the same time, it's still quite a vague uh, uh, concept as the partnership because it is not formalized in a certain way. And uh, we considered that it is a really good time now to define more precisely what is enhanced opportunity partnership, what opportunities it can um, present, and maybe even to create the uh, council, uh, NATO EOP. So some kind of the uh, uh, formal council where these six countries will be able to discuss with the uh, NATO member states uh, are both the future of this partnership and in general the future of the security and the very particular issues. Then we talked about the necessity to have the uh, uh, same wording about Finland and Sweden and Ukraine and Georgia. Because definitely uh, that's been a little bit strange uh, that uh, Finland that also shares border with the uh, with the Russian Federation and also had uh, uh, threats uh, from the Kremlin. Uh, nevertheless, Finland uh, from the very day when they said we would like to be in NATO received, oh, you will be em uh, embraced and welcomed and short procedures. And Ukraine and Georgia never had it. Yes, Finland is a member of the European Union, but what is interesting that NATO never said us that you should be a member of the European Union and that that is preventing you. We always heard that border with the Russian Federation is what preventing you. So that is probably as well as one of very important issues that uh, we should speak about equality, uh, the certain equality and the uh, uh, frank relations to, to the partners. And then uh, two other things that were very practical, we talked about uh, cybersecurity that should be uh, enhanced uh, and uh, uh, even that we already saw in the certain documents that cybersecurity became the fifth domain of the warfare and NATO is accepting it, but still we see the certain technicality and the 
probably a lack in understanding of the political uh, um, leverage that cybersecurity very often can have, and that such uh, actors as the Russian Federation, China, Iran, using this as the weapon. So cybersecurity should not be just the national interest and the national problems, but uh, that should become the equal priority for the NATO member states and for the NATO as the organization as uh, um, other threats that we usually have. And the last but not the least, we talked to the Ukrainian experts about resilience. Because uh, previously in all the NATO documents, we heard that uh, resilience is the national business, that NATO can help with the uh, best practices sharing or something like this, but resilience is your own business. What uh, a pandemic perfectly demonstrated that uh, sometimes it is not the national uh, problem. And definitely, uh, if you see the seven baselines that NATO itself described for resilience, uh, pandemic is perfectly uh, fitting over there. Uh, the situation in Ukraine demonstrated that because we've been building the resilient uh, society, we tried to, like our national resilient uh, strategy uh, is very similar to the NATO, like, or better say, it's based on the NATO 7 um, uh, basic principles, plus we added additional that were important, like financial security, for example, financial stability. Uh, the last 80 days demonstrated that this approach was uh, uh, really important and that was uh, saved a lot of lives and helped the society uh, to function. So that is the sphere where over the we can share our experience with the um, uh, with NATO as an organization as with member states, but that is just like not to go into details in the old document that we wrote, but we talked about the fact that we need to talk about resilience in less national uh, categories that definitely exist, but also to think how we can multiply the resilient effect because of all those NATO uh, ties, connections, links that we already have. Because when you speak about transportation, when you speak about cyber, when you speak about protection of the critical infrastructure, when you speak about um, uh, the big movements of people, that is transnational issues in the current affairs. So that is definitely time probably for NATO to make one step forward um, in terms of the developing resilience concept. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I see that uh, you, you put uh, a lot of, let's say, access to the uh, reshaping strategic uh, relationship with no NATO countries. And uh, also what, what I uh, heard first, uh, a suggestion to, to NATO, stop showing the vulnerability of, of, of NATO in this changing uh, environment, security environment, which uh, represents, uh, in a way, a new environment uh, with with some new threats, cyber threats, and not only, but also the old one, like the, the um, like the threat from the uh, from the Russia Russian Empire, actually, revisionistic policy from from Russia. Uh, thank thank you thank you for now, and I would like to ask the same question. Uh, Mr. William Alberti. Sir, the floor is yours, please. Well, I do think it's an interesting question, but I think we're approaching it the wrong way. Uh, and hear me out, I know the idea that I'm going to say is not going to be adopted at all, but I'll say it anyway. We shouldn't have an unclassified strategic concept at all. This is an artificial construction which occurred at the end of the Cold War. The first four strategic concepts for the defense of the alliance were military documents negotiated by the military committee with input from the political side. So the, the heads of state gave guidance, the ministers and ambassadors engaged, but this was the strategic concept for the defense of the North Atlantic area, um, DC 6-1, uh, then revised MC3 slash 5, then revised in 57, then revised in 1968. So it's only at the end of the Cold War that we have this artificial alliance strategic concept unclassified 1991, and then the MC directive for the military implementation of the strategic concept, which is known as MC400. I think this process has been broken from the start. Uh, it, uh, we were able to adopt our military strategy after the 1991 strategic concept very quickly, but for the second concept, 1999, it took four years for the military committee to agree to a strategic concept. For the third 
strategic concept after the end of the Cold War. The strategic concept 2010 adopted the Lisbon summit. It took two years for the military strategy to be written. And that was an incredibly arduous process that actually required a separate deterrence and defense posture review because the last strategic concept was so bad. It was so the wrong document at the wrong time. It, it made no sense for 2010 when Russia had already invaded Georgia for us to see Russia as not just a future partner, but potential member and a lover and a friend. It was ridiculous in 2010. It sounded stupid then. Um, and there was no way to hook in there the idea of the defense of the alliance. It was all about out of area operations, voluntary uh, actions. Uh, so, so really, I think the whole strategic concept process, and this has been, I think, proven. They were supposed to come up with a draft strategic concept. The attack on Ukraine forced everyone to rewrite it. The fact that it had to be rewritten after Russia attacked Ukraine tells you what an empty process this is. It's not strategic at all. It's not looking at the defense of the alliance. It's trying to shoehorn political issues in to something that is essentially a defensive concept, a military concept. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how we incorporate deterrence in here. It'll be interesting to see if we can capture concepts like forward defense. But I think as we go forward, really defending the alliance for defense and thinking about that, the political side of the strategic concept becomes less and less salient. The things that we can and should talk about aren't going to be in there because they have to be discussed in a classified uh, format. And frankly, I think it's going to be a gear grinding exercise. It'll be great if it's wonderful. It'll, I'll praise it to the heavens if it's great, but I bet it'll be a compromise and the real work is going to end up in the military committee. And, you know, it, it's hard. It's so hard to capture this in a political format when, again, the NATO alliance, this is about common defense, this is about collective defense, this is about real military threats to our territory. And it's not about convincing our publics that we're friendly or whatever. This is about defending our core values and our core ideas. I, I don't envy Dominic. I know he's going through hell trying to come to, a, to a, an agreed text. Uh, and I hope it's worth it. I really do. And like I said, if it's if it's solid, that would be great. But I really do think uh, we need to look back at some of these older processes and realize that having some basically PR exercise for a document um, isn't really where we need to be spending a lot of our time. And I'm glad that they've extended the Secretary General because the idea that we were going to drop the strategic concept in Madrid and then hand it to the next sec gen and say, good luck. Uh, that that just seems strange. I'm really glad Stoltenberg has another year, at least to try to marshal the process of where the 2019 military strategy meets the military strategy for the defense of the North Atlantic area, how this all works together, how this fits into the defense planning process. We're going to have to revise the GRPs, the graduated response plans for the defense of Europe. Uh, not only because of Russia's actions, but Finland and Sweden's membership. And that's where the game really is. And that's one thing that uh, I, I wish I were at NATO for that part, because that's going to be exciting. So that's all I have to say there. Thank you. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, that's the, it's, it is not the first time when we criticize the strategic con con concept. Actually, I remember Washington's summit and the concept adopted in Washington in 1999 during the uh, operation Allied Force against Yugoslavia. It was also a uh, very disputable situation and the concept was also criticized. So th thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And I would like to uh, ask the same question, uh, my colleague Martin Sokolov. Martin, the first is, is yours, please. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm gonna be upfront and just say that my biggest contribution right now is just to recommend to everybody watching uh, this is just play back what William said. I mean, I love the to the to the spot. This would be the greatest possible thing I can do in terms of a contribution, and uh, particularly that uh, really, uh, yes, NATO is a defense alliance. Why, why have an unclassified version of the strategic concept? Uh, strategic concept. Yeah, the idea would be you know building uh building trust, i.e., with Russia, so they know oh, okay, NATO is just still in defense, not going to expand with its, I don't know, 10, 15 total troops in, uh, troops in total in uh, Eastern Europe. Now, it, it's, it's objectively, to an extent, counterproductive. And he, here's the other, the other issue, and uh, Hannah pointed it out with the entire idea of uh, defense and dialogue. 
Now, the problem with that was that while we, we are pondering, rationalizing, and discussing, well, Russia has been acting. It, it hasn't been uh, passive. And yes, in my previous answer, I did emphasize that it does not have a bright future domestically, but it still has the capacity to be uh, destructive and disruptive uh, force uh, beyond its borders and and in Europe. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, leave the impression every, to everybody that you know uh, we shouldn't worry about Russia. It's done. Uh, no, and it will be uh, increasing in terms of uh, acts of of desperation, objectively, because even when we often talk about you know the hybrid threats emanating from Russia or what it calls calls new generation warfare, the entire approach of Russian foreign policy based on this. But let's not forget, it, it's a product of weakness, uh, because Russia needed means in order to make up, um, you know, the, the fact uh, of the superiority in terms of military, of defense, of uh, economy, and overall progress of the West. The only way uh, to do it was play this, uh, this disruptive role it has been uh, doing. But uh, going to, uh, you know, the uh, secure architecture that Russia has been impacting, and of course, uh, ironically, in a, in a positive way, basically turning uh, Vladimir Putin, in, in a sense, as uh, NATO's uh, best ally, because you know, previous U.S. presidents, with their attempts, for example, the U.S. president attempts to raise the overall budget of the different countries with the certain uh, future members being on defense in the long run with the source of, um, you know, identity crisis NATO experienced. Putin resolved all of this, uh, all of these issues. Um, but okay, not, not to get too involved in that. But um, with the secure architect architecture to be in place, um, what I'm hoping to see, whether it's going to be explicitly stated uh, in the concept, uh, but although I think it did, because, uh, it, it's going to be because it could be big enough, would be to enhance, um, you know, NATO EU uh, cooperation. Now, of course, NATO is the defense aspect, is the provider of security of stability. And so forth, whereas the EU is more of the economic, um, you know, dynamo. But here's the important issue in this uh, situation, because the EU has also been looking in a way to become at least on some level a uh, provider of um, security and defense. And of course, that would be through the monetary approach with the funding it can provide. We see this with Passport has been adopted and there could be more funds. In the long run, this is going to be very important if it's spent properly, because while NATO can coordinate, you know, with, uh, with the collective security and defense, can with enhanced foreign presence, tailored foreign presence, permanent foreign presence, and so on and so forth, with funding given spread properly, uh, countries, uh, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, can use uh, the provided money to enhance their own military industrial complex. Now, in, in the long run, this can be very productive. First of all, because of uh, competition is usually uh, very, very uh, productive in terms of outcomes. But secondly, uh, it will not create a system where we only have uh, countries of producers and consumers in terms of military capabilities. We can have different developments, coordination, which will not only um, enhance the level of consolidation and coordination within the EU and NATO, but also uh, between EU uh, and NATO. And it's going to be uh, very important for the countries from Central and Eastern Europe to keep emphasizing the importance uh, to uh, both Brussels and Washington of uh, the respective regions, uh, the Black Sea and the border uh, with Russia. And uh, I think it will also be very productive to have um, between states if they can spearhead ideas uh, and uh, acts of, uh, for example, shared air policing uh, and the Black Sea uh, shared fleet. Uh, Black Sea Fleet could be possible, even if, uh, under a NATO flag. But the idea is coordinate, cooperate, and uh, hopefully actions will follow the strategic concept because... Uh, oh, I'm going to end with a quote because uh, uh, while I was looking at the question, I immediately got reminded of uh, you know, one of General George Patton's famous quotes, you know, a good plan uh, enacted now is better than uh, the perfect plan enacted tomorrow. So it's we're waiting for the concept, but we need solid uh, actions. Not, that, not just the dialogue part with Russia or for internal consumption. Gonna stop here. Thank, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. I would say that uh, it's, I mean, you mentioned many things, but they, they were also there before. I mean, in, in that way or another, like cooperation between EU and NATO. So maybe we should expect a kind of uh, continuation, maybe evolution, but nothing spectacular in that, in that sense. And uh, you mentioned Russia as a, as a factor which uh, unifies or unites NATO members, not, not only NATO, but also European countries. So 
uh, it's a surprising result of this uh, situation we see today that actually NATO is unified and uh, the crisis you remember uh, after the Iraqi uh, operation, it's gone. I believe it's gone and NATO is is getting a new, uh, new perspective in that way. I, I will stop here as well and I would like to ask the same question um, Mr. Dominik Jankowski, who is insider, so it would be, I believe, different perspective a little bit. Sir, the floor is yours, please. Uh, so, um, so Martin finished with a quote. I will, um, I'll start with a quote. Um, you know, one of the greatest strategists of all times, my, Mike Tyson, uh, used to say, "You, you have a strategy until you are punched in the face." Right. Um, so, you, you know, I let me for a second zoom out and, and say, you know, like the whole discussion in the EU about the strategy compass. Yeah, that, that was. I was observing that from here, from NATO headquarters, uh, from the uh, Polish delegation um, to NATO perspective. And, you know, we have seen all those discussions, preparations uh, over the months, um, ref, uh, you know, revision of the text. And, and then suddenly the, um, the invasion on February 24th happened and it's Mike Tyson moment. And, and you are like, what I'm going to do with that document? It doesn't fit into the reality. So you, you know, I, I think I, I think um, I've uh, I've appreciated the unfettered political advice of of William and and supported by Martin. But let me say the strategy concept will happen. Um, uh, so uh, we will have to face with um, uh, with with it and with the end product. And uh, as always in multilateral organizations, that say. That's a compromise in the end, um, but but I think look if 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 that's going to happen, let's um, let's discuss what's important in there. Um, and I think if from a Polish perspective or Eastern flank perspective, th there are uh, at least three goals that I, I think are going to be important for the strategic um, concept. The first one is to make sure that the description of Russia is realistic and will be still relevant in 10 years. I think the mistake that we've done in, in Lisbon is that when you're reading the concept right now, you're basically laughing and you're saying this is irrelevant. So I think, you know, I and we always say aspirational language is great, but I think with Russia, aspirational language doesn't work. Um, so I think this such a concept should, should basically set out a clear vision of um, how... Uh, um, how the alliance sees Russia uh, in a, let's say, decade, decade perspective um, in a realistic way. That leads me to my second point and second pillar, which is basically deterrence and defense. Because in order to make sure that we remain credible and, and Russia will and is and will remain the biggest threat for this alliance, we, we need to maintain the credibility of deterrence and defense posture, which basically means and let me pick up uh, some elements from what William is saying, that we are able to translate what we have achieved already on the deterrence and defense side, the, um, the strategic documents, military documents, military doctrine, um, and the DDA and the NWCC, so all the military, the military compass that we have, and translate that um, to, a, um, to a document which will be unclassified. That's going to be super challenging, of course, uh, because how to translate classified into unclassified, that's you cannot do it in a proper way, but but I think if if we can use that document to make it happen, that 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 will be the goal. And I think we need to also set the bar high because deterrence is defense, deterrence and defense posture, collective defense is the primus inter pares. It, even if we are going to maintain the free core task, and this is probably what's going to happen, collective defense is the essence of this life. Which leads me to my third point, and, and, and I think this is also important in, in the current security environment, that we, main, we maintain our open-door policy credible for those who really want to enter these lines. And I think, you know, the, if, I, if we had this panel last year, like, you know, nobody would have said, oh, yeah, Sweden and Finland will be NATO next year. Um, no, I mean, that, that's... That, that's a game changer. And I think it's also should allow us to think a little bit more how to make sure that the open door policy also for countries such as Ukraine and Georgia is still a credible, relevant uh, option on the table. 
Um, so not only reconfirming what we said in Bucharest in 2008, that's great. We are repeating that. We have been repeating that since 2008, in fact, in different forms. Um, but rethinking a little bit um, how open door policy contributes um, uh, to the security and, and stability of, of the region, which brings me also to what um, Hannah said at the beginning a little bit, you know, a partnership for peace uh, is, is a concept that with Russia and Belarus in that framework, it's neither partnership nor is designed to um, to maintain peace. So I think there are elements in our partnership policy that are simply not not uh, not relevant anymore, and they, they need a, a strategic reference. So you know, all in all, I think we'll have a document which, as William said, will be in the end a, a compromise. But I think from the Eastern flank perspective, from the Polish perspective, if we can work around those three pillars that I've mentioned and, and make them relevant when you read the document in 10 years, I, I think then we'll achieve uh, at least the unclassified level of discussion in a, in a, in a pretty solid uh, manner. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's, it's a rather realistic approach uh, towards Russia, what I heard from, from you. From your voice uh, here, and deterrence and defense seems sounds like uh, factory settings in, in, in a way because it's like they're coming back to, to, to the basics in, in that way. I think deterrence and yeah, that just just my my uh, opinion, and uh, I really uh, I, I agree completely about the that question about uh, the, the future. It's not necessary. Uh, the the question uh, related to the to the um, to the st uh, strategy itself, but uh, it it will be a real question maybe outside the strategy. Who knows? Uh, the question about the relations with Russia and Ukraine after the war it's it's a real question and how NATO will face that. Uh, will is, uh, is it possible to see a part of that uh, response to that question in the strategy? We will see. I, I, I guess it is, but it's probably rather politics than, than strategy itself. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting question, definitely. So th thank you very much uh, once again. Um, uh, Kuba, uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, as you have noticed, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, Hanna is no longer with us uh, due to other duties. Uh, um, well, uh, regretfully, um, because uh, she said some inspiring things. Uh, also, uh, just just uh, as did you, of course. And uh, um, you know, um, this was very interesting. What um, Dominic said before a minute about this relevance of uh, the strategic concept, because if we look um, at the Lisbon. The Lisbon strategic concept, uh, in fact, uh, is it relevant today after 10 years? Uh, uh, because, you know, after the Lisbon uh, strategic concept, uh, many things many things happened, including war in Syria, uh, Crimea annexation, um, pandemics, uh, the Donbass war, and of course the Russian, uh, the Russian aggression. So uh, this concept is a piece of paper uh, right now. But uh, don't you think, uh, short question, uh, because you know we have about 15 minutes. Um, don't you think that um, the Lisbon concept, that, that I was just thinking about it, um, that the Lisbon concept is in fact um, a product of, uh, of its times, of its time. It was in 2010, and people in the West um, quite often um, thought, no, there would be no major war in terms in, in, in North Atlantic region, let's transform our armies into expeditionary forces to send them out of area, etc., etc. You know, uh, an illusion of welfare and peace, and it was reflected also in many uh, national national uh, strategic concept uh, strategies of security, including Polish one. So, don't you think it's uh, uh, the Lisbon concept reflects? Um, the spirit, the spirit of, of uh, you know, the first decade of, uh, of the 21st century, when everyone in the West was convinced, no, there would be no war, there is uh, no probability of, uh, of a serious uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, symmetric war. That's, 
Pirate Will, who wants to answer me? Uh, <clears throat> yes, William, yeah. Yeah, I, no, I, I understand, but it was incredibly frustrating. I mean, for me as a security professional, um, watching Russia systematically violate the CFE treaty up until 2007 and then suspend it. And, you know, one of the reasons that you have arms control is... In Georgia, in Georgia, of course. Well, right, and then the invasion of Great. Well, that's what I was saying. The compliance or non-compliance with an arms control treaty tells you a lot about the intention of that state and the fact that Russia didn't want where its armor was going to be accountable and visible and 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 provable with an arms control should have told us that they're they're planning to do terrible things. Their non-compliance with the Vienna documents observation pro uh, protocols tells you they didn't want us to really closely observe their exercises because we would have probably seen that a lot of them were very very hollow inside. Uh, so. For those of us in this field, we knew that Russia was angry and revisionist and was going to continue to do terrible things. All the alarm bells were going off. And yet you're right. The spirit of the time was, eh, go back to sleep. It's out of area operations. It's voluntary. Um, you know, coalition's the willing. Let's hit the reset button on Russia. And it, it, it made a lot of us just kind of lose our minds because it wasn't the spirit of the time. It was this. It was the reflected spirit of the wishes of the 90s, which even then, where Russia was waging a horrible war on its own people in Chechnya, where it was on the wrong side in Yugoslavia, the alarm bells have been going off, but we chose to ignore them and then wrote this document that's basically, you know, peace studies fan fiction uh, that then became not only the NATO strategic concept, but the strategic concept for the defense of a lot of countries. Sweden got rid of its territorial army. I mean, what an idiotic move. Whereas there's Finland going, nah, we're not giving up anything. We're, we're still worried about these guys because we know what they're up to. Uh, and there were some other folks, uh, some in Poland, some in the Baltics, who were just ringing that alarm bell and saying, we've gone too far with uh, all this peace and love stuff. And we have to recognize that the world is still a terrible place and wishing doesn't make it different. Um, yeah, yeah, um, but you know, speaking about the, the strategies also, are uh, continuing this, um, this, this topic, because you used some quotes, uh, I, I, I also know some quotes, uh, uh, for instance, I remember, uh, I can't remember exactly who, who said this, this was one of American U U.S. generals, um, Ben Hodges, probably, he said, hope is not a strategy. And of course, we can criticize uh, document strategy. So yes, I, I agree that um, uh, um, but NATO needs a strategy, it's a relevant strategy and uh, a well prepared strategy, uh, um, considering Russia as a threat. Because another question: Don't you don't you think and don't you agree? Well, perhaps that's a, a um, that's a very uh, simple question for people in Poland, in Finland, or in the Baltic states, or Bulgaria, or Romania, but um, what Hanna said, deterrence and dialogue. NATO tried for a long time to conduct the policy of det deterrence and dialogue with Russia. But the problem is that any dialogue with Russia is impossible, because Russia doesn't want any dialogue. If you, if you want to talk to Russia, Russia for Russia this is a, a sign of your weakness. So we, we have a proverb in Polish that uh, uh, if you give them a finger, they will tell they will take your hand. So um, don't you think that it's high time to um, you know even preparing this new new strategic concept uh, to um, recognize Russia as a as a threat, not for for a month, not for a year, but uh, uh, a basic threat. Well. Are we going back to the roots? Because originally NATO was constructed against the Soviet Union. So, is it isn't it time to do it again? Yeah, Martin, or probably. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would actually like to bridge the two questions because I want to say a couple of words on your initial one. And first of all, of course, wishful thinking is not a good uh, strategy, neither for defense nor for attack. Uh, but here's the thing uh, that we often, uh, peace and wider dialogue often is omitted. Of course, every strategy is based on planning and, uh, and analysis. And I had the pleasure of spending a couple of years at the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center. And for me, that's one of the backbones on every sex, uh, successful defense, be it on an international level or national level. That's uh, 
uh, intelligence analysis and the information sharing. With NATO, yes, uh, often the wider public just talks about, you know, the joint exercises, the procurement of equipment, you know, the things, the hardware that it's visible, that, it's, you know, can serve as basically something as a uh, uniting pillar and so forth. But one of the reasons for uh, NATO's strengths is precisely the capability for every country to share information with another country, even if it's not important just to, you know, uh, so uh, to evaluate what you have as a uh, piece of uh, information and possible um, uh, possible future uh, outcomes. Because yes, nobody, as far as I know, has a crystal ball back at home or you know uh, leaves the planning of national and regional security to mediums. It's done on uh, analysis. Uh, and going in with this into the fact how Russia should be treated in the long term, well, again, we deal with evalu evaluation and analysis of uh, open source and intelligence uh, uh, information. I would say, should there be dialogue with Russia? Explicit, yes. However, it should be done on key principles that we want Russia to talk with us, with NATO, the West, with EU, the general Euro uh, Atlantic community, on the pillars that we hold, uh, which are the reasons that we have organizations such as NATO, to ensure the rule of law, of peace, security, stability. So when and if Russia is willing to do so, to recognize that fact, of course, more than welcome, uh, we should more than welcome people from Moscow. Yes, they can talk. But otherwise, we just feed into it, uh, you know, destructive and disruptive uh, influence where it tries to, you know, the old uh, Roman idea of divide et impera, just to divide, to separate. And whenever it cannot get something across, just to, you know, uh, stop the process, to, to slow it down. So, uh, what I said with a lot of words, yes, dialogue with Russia, but uh, on our grounds. When they reach our uh, level in terms of uh, principle and values, they're more than welcome to talk. And even join if they're not willing. Yeah, I'm afraid that's impossible because this is in Russia's interest to keep the West divided. Because if the West is united, or when there is a one voice of NATO, of the European Union, uh, etc., this is a disaster for Russia. So that, that's why Russia tries to divide the West, to bribe, corrupt, blackmail, threaten, intimidate, etc., etc. Okay, but I want so to... I'm just saying that it should be done from our ground. You know, we have the criteria, we have the moral superiority, even if you will. So as long as they don't meet the criteria, defense, defense, defense. Dialogue, optional with the end if they, if they wish to do so and do show uh, willingness to change their international conduct. Yeah, dialogue, but with a big stick in my hand. Uh, uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Conrad. Uh, uh, if you if you if you want to sum up and to well and to finish our panel, uh, uh, please. Uh, yeah, um, yes, definitely. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I would say that uh, we're rather optimistic about NATO, and it's. Uh, we see evolution. We see uh, new challenges. Sometimes a little bit old one, but I think that uh, what I heard from you it is that NATO is still important element of the security system, and no no question uh, about that. And uh, I believe that uh, it is, it was, and it's still uh, this unique community of values. Uh, committed to the principles of solidarity. We see this solidarity today with, with Ukraine. Individual liberty, uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Uh, it is a uh, defensive political and military alliance. I, I think everybody uh, was stressing that fact that NATO is not threatening anyone, but it's a guarantor of peace, security, and broadly defined uh, development of states and societies. Um, so, uh, we also agree that the new security environment represents a challenge for the international stability. As a consequence, NATO's strategic ad <coughs> adaptation continues. We discuss this adaptation, possible directions, or rather, evolution. Uh, so, the al alliance remains ready to face tomorrow's challenges. It remains strong, military, and it's more united than ever before and uh, the new members are coming. Uh, ironically, it, it's the, the result of the President Putin's uh, policy today, 
uh, and uh, so that, that's the su it's a surprise from me to, to be honest uh, to sum up the alliance is definitely fit for the future although we were critical from time to time especially about the political context of the of the uh, NATO strategy I mean the, the document sometimes it was a little bit too late sometimes the, I mean I'm talking about the previous the documents sometimes it was a little bit too optimistic so maybe this new uh, strategy will be more realistic and uh, personally i think that uh, although i shared the criticism about about um, one of the nato partners i'm talking about the Ru russia uh, today i believe that maybe there is a chance for this dialogue in the future but i believe not with mr putin's russia but maybe there, there is a chance to, to see a new Russia in, in the future. Who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm idealistic here, to be honest. I'm very idealistic. But I believe that NATO will face this uh, cha challenge, opportunity, maybe, and risk in the future uh, as it uh, did many times before. Thank you very much indeed. Let, let, let me thank you once again, our guests. Uh, our, uh, our guest speakers were uh, Mr. William Alberki, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, United Kingdom, Germany. Uh, Mr. Dominik Jankowski, head of the political section, permanent delegation of the Republic of Poland to NATO. Ms. Hanna Schellest, director of security programs, Foreign Policy Council, Ukrainian Prison, Ukraine. Martin Sokolov, Center for National Security and Defense Research at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, Bulgaria. And panel was moderated by Jakub Polkowski and Konrad okay. Institute of Central Europe, Poland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. See you. We heard a very interesting discussion on NATO and current situation in Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. Now we shall move on to our third and final panel. This time the focus will be on how to respond to the Ukrainian refugee crisis in Central Europe. The panelists come from the Center of Migration Research, University of Warsaw in Poland, the Organization for Aid to Refugees in Prague, Czech Republic, at the University of Latvia and from the Institute of Political Studies, Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw, Poland. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Aleksandra Koczyńska-Zolnik from the Institute of Central Europe and uh, Dr. Adam Reichardt uh, from the New Eastern Europe Journal. I'm looking forward uh, to, uh, to a stimulating debate. Aleksandra and Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are pleased to uh, welcome you to the first panel of um, our conference. Uh, my name is Alexandra Kuczynska-Zonik and together with uh, Adam Reichardt from uh, New Eastern Europe, we will moderate the discussion. Uh, it is an honor for us to, um, uh, to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, Marta Jaroszewicz, who is uh, from Center of Migration Research, University of, of uh, Warsaw, uh, um, uh, University of uh, Warsaw, uh, Poland, uh, Martin Kaprans from University of Latvia, and uh, Oleksi Polecki from Institute of uh, Political Studies, Polish Academy of Science uh, from Poland. And uh, we are still waiting for uh, Martin uh, Rozumek from Organization for Aid. Uh, to refugees from Prague, Czech Republic, and uh, we hope that uh, he will uh, join us. Um, our today's topic is, uh, um, is concerning uh, refugees from uh, Ukraine. It's a very uh, significant and uh, sensitive uh, subject um, because uh, it was Russia invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, which has triggered one of the largest and fastest 
refugee movements that Europe has witnessed uh, since the end of the uh, Second World War. And uh, I would like to start uh, from quotation uh, from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, he said um, a few days uh, ago, he said that uh, since the beginning of the war, um, almost 6 million Ukrainian um, refugees have fled the country um, and they crossed uh, the borders of uh, Poland, uh, Romania, Hungary, Russia, several uh, European, um, Central European countries. Um, additionally, um, about 8 million people um, are inter uh, are um, displaced inside uh, Ukraine. So uh, we would like to start a uh, discussion um, from uh, from describing directions and scale of uh, refugee flow from Ukraine. And I can see uh, at least two tasks before us. Uh, first. As I said, describe the situation in particular um, Central European countries and then define any challenges for governments and for societies. So, uh, Oleksi, could you start uh, from Ukraine? Thank you very much. Yeah. If you are talking about humanitarian crisis, I would start that we can divide uh, like three uh, different groups of people who are directly touched by conflict. So one group of people, and actually it's a most difficult situation, it's people who are uh, exactly now or who are, who were or who will be on the exactly front line and the area of, uh, let's say, hot conflict. So those people, uh, they are touched by uh, war very directly. And uh, as we know, even Mariupol, which is one of the most destroyed city, till now has near 100, 150,000 of inhabitants. So more than 260,000 of uh, inhabitants of Mariupol left, but one third, more or less, uh, people left. So it's one of the group which touched by war uh, probably in the worst uh, situation. They suffer from uh, very basic needs, they uh, under the fire, etc. etc. So the second group is uh, IDP, internally displaced person, as you mentioned, which are in Ukraine. Uh, the number of them were changing because some people already left uh, to the era, for example, in the central Ukraine or Kiev or Kiev uh, Oblast. Uh, and uh, more or less, it's near seven, nine millions of people. So those people were suffer mainly from the uh, necessity to establish their life. Uh, according to recent poll, which was made by Razumko Center, uh, more than half of uh, people were uh, actually waiting to come back in nearest future, so it's mean like in uh, nearest maybe months. Uh, some of them already uh, went back to home, but more or less uh, 30, even 40 percent of people were really don't know where, when can they left uh, and went back to home. So among those uh, people, the main challenges, it's actually like humanitarian aspects, it's uh, access to the housing, food, and basic needs. Uh, according to World Food Program, uh, it was delivered uh, 3.4 million uh, of people with food in Ukraine. Uh, but more or less, we can say that people manage to survive, especially in this very challenging and uh, extreme situation. There is not so big help from uh, the side of Ukrainian government. So the average person who was displaced can get near like 60 euro per month and children near 90 euro per month, which is actually very low. But in general, people survive. People are more or less in uh, like uh, based on uh, helps of other uh, local people and relatives. And the third group, it's uh, actually refugees who left Ukraine. 
And as you mentioned already, it was near 6 million of people who already left Ukraine. There are numbers of people who came back to Ukraine according to, for example, uh, border controls uh, from the beginning of uh, war in February 24. It was 1.3 million of people who came back to Ukraine. So among those people, we have kind of different uh, strategies uh, to surviving. So majority of them were awaiting uh, just uh, possibility to come back. And it's difficult to estimate now how many people are ready and who would really come back to Ukraine. Uh, 90% of those people who left the uh, border of Ukraine, uh, it's uh, women and children, more than 90%. And uh, for example, some uh, surveys was made in April and it was uh, near 88% of uh, refugees they claim that they would like to come back to Ukraine and they don't have plan to settle for a long term in Europe. Uh, according to another poll, which I saw for actually was made in May, it was near uh, 20% of people who are not planning to come back, but 80% are uh, planning to come back. But the number of people who would really come back, it's really a big question in the sense of how this war will continue. So if it would finish more or less to a moment when people who could secure, like come back in more or less secure situation, probably the number of uh, Ukrainian refugees coming back to Ukraine would be much higher. But if it would keep for at least half of year, for example, or more, we could expect that more people would settle down because it's, a uh, time when, uh, for example, someone already has established life, found a job, and uh, it's much more difficult to come back to Ukraine, especially under a situation when Ukrainian society would face a very significant problem in the sense of economy. According to different uh, estimations, one third uh, till half of uh, Ukrainian economy would uh, actually fall down uh, in this year. And uh, another challenge which would really face Ukrainian government is to provide a job. So at this moment, for example, we have even according to official data, which is very limited, but it shows the uh, pattern. So we have like 12 person on one working place in Ukraine looking for a job. So it means if situation would not really change in nearest future, and it's mean like nearest month, uh, the situation would go worse and worse, and we will have very significant challenge how actually people can live uh, without like job and housing. And especially if it would come to, to winter, the Ukrainian government would need to establish some fund of rehousing or maybe like building temporary bu uh, housing. And actually, I don't think that at this point, Ukrainian government has any answer on this question. So if we look on countries uh, who accepted Ukrainians, so of course, Poland, it's the uh, biggest country. And... Uh, Altogether, 3.4 million of Ukrainians left Ukraine via Polish border. Uh, it's difficult to say exactly how many of them right now left in Poland. So approximately it's 1.3 million. Uh, we can note that, for example, in May we have more people who are coming back to Ukraine uh, then to crossing border uh, out of Ukraine. So, for example, like uh, yesterday, it was uh, data that 31 thousands of people crossed border in Ukraine and like 20 thousands of people came out of Ukraine. So this uh, trend also visible, also Germany, for example, where uh, said that we have significant number of people who are actually uh, living compared to who are coming, but it's mean like it doesn't mean that people are not there, but it's mean like now less people arriving from Ukraine. Uh, 
It's also connected to this uh, uh, situation on the front line. So if Ukrainian army would be able to free territory, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine and the southern part of Ukraine, so more people would try to come back. But in general, uh, the situation would still keep for uh, maybe not even months, but for years. I mean, the people who are already in the European Union, even if it would be significantly less than now we have people who moved, but they would uh, face necessity to survive in the nearest future in the sense of uh, economical problem, etc., etc. So probably at this point, I will give floor to another panelist and in the next round, I will tell a little bit more. Uh, thank you very much uh, for describing uh, the current situation in Ukraine. And you said, uh, you mentioned Poland as a country which uh, has received the, 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 great, the greatest number of uh, refugees. That's why, that's why I would like to move to uh, Marta. Uh, uh, could you say more about the uh, situation in Poland? I mean, the, the scale, the directions, maybe some problems which uh, Poland uh, uh, faces now? Uh, dear Olad, uh, dear Adam, thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, sure. But of course, uh, some of my thoughts were already stolen by Alexi, but I think I will try to uh, to add some news uh, as well. I think you, Ola, you mentioned that already, but I think one should really um, emphasize really the, the, the humanitarian crisis, the, should emphasize really the way that Russians are, are the Russians are uh conducting the 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 fight and the the consequences for the people so this is really the the biggest war of one state against another in europe after 1945 and uh, unfortunately the russian forces are using indiscriminate attacks on civilian areas infrastructure strikes on protected objects such as hospitals and schools use of ballistic missiles and ban weapons so that's why we really witness unprecedented escalation of violations of humanitarian and human rights laws. Uh, and we were all, all shocked by the revealed information on, of, on mass graves of civilian murdered in the locality situated near, near capital city of Kiev. But, uh, but also recently maybe we got used to, right, to those atrocities, but it's still to be seen, for instance, what kind of atrocities are happening in uh, occupied Kherson, Berdyansk, or even in Mariupol, right? I mean, we don't know a lot of. So why I'm mentioning that? Uh, I'm mentioning because I did a lot of interviews with uh, migrants, and uh, yes, maybe economic situation come to a fore in the last few weeks, but still this is really the, the individual risk, right, that they face every day, risk of losing life, risk of uh, being injured, that really force them to leave, right? And and um, uh, what is also uh, tragic in this situation is that however majority of people coming to, I will, I will maybe uh, give more details later, majority of people coming to Poland are coming from Eastern Ukraine, but it doesn't mean that we don't have, for instance, migrants from um, refugees from Western, because Western Ukraine, especially at the beginning, was hit as well. They were, um, there were uh, strikes at, at Lviv, Wutsk, Obwast, and unfortunately, even yesterday, right, we witnessed one uh, near to the Polish border, meaning that um, it's very difficult also to judge, right, and I don't judge who and why because i believe that all those people they 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 are really in danger of of like of losing life and being injured right that's why they come to poland uh, so and uh, in those tragic circumstances as of may 15 as many as 6 million point two people uh, left ukraine this is uh, this is official data by the unhcr unhcr collects data from the border guard services border guard uh, uh, units of, of the neighboring countries and the polish border guard is saying that when it comes to poland this is 3.37 
a three million point uh, three seven, right? Uh, people uh, that that uh, came to Poland, of course. Uh, so far, of course, there is discussion how many of those people uh, leave, uh, who, who stayed, who not, who came back also uh, recently. And this is what UNHCR is noticing as well. There is a huge number of those uh, uh, returning, uh, 1.8. But again, these are uh, we don't know who are those people and whether they, these are not the same people, right? Because these are border crossing points, right? So border crossings, meaning that, uh, for instance, somebody who came to Poland may leave uh, and for a few, few days, few weeks to visit family and then come back to Poland, right? And and, and we expect, uh, we suppose as researchers that, that this is more this way, that, that actually long-term returns. So far, we don't, uh, we don't see so many, so many long-term returns. And okay, so um, so how many pe people are actually living in Poland? We don't know, but we know more than we knew month ago, right? Because there is a, there is a lot of new research coming. Uh, also, uh, quite the, the 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 system of registration based of so called PESEL. PESEL meaning the the individual individual uh, personal number uh, given to Ukrainian num uh, people uh, given by Polish authorities. It's moving quite well. So, uh, so more or less, we know how many people are actually. Uh, are th there, as I said, there is also research. My institute, meaning Center for Migration Studies, is currently starting really big uh, representative research. We hope we'll be able to share results in like month or two with you. There was also very good research by the. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, the Union of the Metropolitan Cities uh, in Poland based on the data from the mobile phones, which was quite uh, quite impressive. So, and also our center prepared some uh, prognosis. So based on those prognosis, we estimated that at the end of April, they were 1.4 to 1 to uh, 1.5 million Ukrainians in Poland. Uh, and uh, all other people either left for other EU countries, either uh, can come back to Ukraine. And uh, the, the dynamics, as I said uh, already, is much uh, is, is 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 much weaker than at the beginning. At the beginning, in the first two three weeks, these were like two hundred thousand people crossing the border every day. Now it's uh, it's up it's from twenty to forty thousand, depending on the day. And also one one should also look at what I said at the beginning, right? Really, I mean those atrocities. They really um, they really uh, they can be really seen in the statistics right so if there is a if there is like a bombing heavy bombing or something like that in maybe in next three four days we may expect a rise in number of border crossing this is really happening and okay why poland i um, mean like many many people are asking me why poland right and uh, i would say that it's not that we are so uh, <laughs> that we are so special i would not say i would say there is a complex uh, there is a, there are certain factors. Some some are dependent on Poland, and some are independent of Poland. So first of all, uh, like it's not the biggest uh, land border between Ukraine and the EU. The biggest is the Romanian one, but it's the most accessible with the highest number. I think I mean I was always and Adam knows that I was always writing that we need to build more border crossing points, and we didn't. But uh, but it seems that like still. Uh, it's the we have the, the biggest number of border crossing points with the with Ukraine, and also what is the uh, what is the really important is that since the first day Poland opened all the border crossing points, meaning uh, the eight one right that we have uh, the uh, into into uh, pedestrian ones, so that uh, the other countries like Hungary and and Slovakia they did it only like after a few days and not all the border crossing points and it was very important in the first days right in the direction the second thing would be of course uh, i would say that this is migration network theory that can explain uh, a lot meaning that there was a huge di ukrainian diaspora be before the war 
And of course, uh, like people and, and this migration theory, uh, migration network theory is saying that people move where they know somebody, right? So they moved to Poland because they had family or relatives, or at, at least it was not a country that they have no idea of, right? So that's why uh, before the war, we had, there were, uh, uh, I mean, depending on the statistics, even up to 2.5 uh, two, two, uh, two million Ukrainians usually working in Poland. But one should also uh, remember the Polish, uh, the Ukrainian ethnic minority that was living for centuries in Poland. It, it was also a very important factor because the, the, the Polish uh, Ukrainian minority was very much engaged, right, uh, in organizing humanitarian assistance. And uh, and of course uh, cultural similarities and so on, right? So it all like it all culminated in, in the fact that Poland was the was the, the main accepting countries. Um, I but uh, as I said, um, uh, apart from uh, from the fact that uh, that uh, the Poland opened this pedestrian uh, border crossing points, also. Uh, it was the it was the facilitation of the legal procedures, right? Especially in the first days, it was very important that all the people who, for instance, didn't have internet international biometric passports, only internal passports. Sometimes even people only with really <laughs> scale documents were allowed to for fifteen days to uh, to enter Poland, right? And it was very important in first two three weeks before before the EU launch the temporary the temporary the temporary pro protection directive. Um, okay, so I'm not sure. Shall I continue with the challenges? I mean, because uh, you know, those uh, those two million people are uh, d doing in Poland. Maybe I will just also mention uh, now uh, the final uh, comment that uh, up to one hundred thousand people actually left. Ukrainian migrants left Poland, uh, especially male, men, right, uh, and came back to Ukraine. I, I mean, in terms of, I think this is demographic, more or less demographic picture. So I will, uh, maybe to the policies, I will come back later, right? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marta. I feel that uh, it is so broad issue that we can continue and talk more and more, but uh, I would like to ask uh, Martins uh, because uh, uh, we usually focus on when concerning uh, refugees from Ukraine. We usually cons uh, we usually uh, focus on those uh, big countries uh, uh, which uh, which received uh, the, the large number of, of um, uh, refugees. But uh, I feel that uh, Latvia could be a quite interesting example how. How a country, a uh, small country with uh, more or less two million um, residents, uh, uh, how uh, how uh, how it manages uh, uh, refugees cr uh, refugee cr crisis, and uh, what are the uh, factors why uh, why those people from Ukraine uh, come to uh, come to Latvia? Why why this direction? So, Martins, could, could could you explain? Yes, thank you, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, Latvia does not have direct border as Poland with Ukraine or as Slovakia, and also the proximity is different. It's much much further away from uh, from the uh, main uh, main uh, conflict zones uh, in Ukraine. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Latvia has uh, been, of course, part uh, and parcel in this uh, uh, latest process of uh, refugee mobility, Ukrainian, uh, in the mobility of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and actually, uh, Alexander mentioned the crisis, but I'm not sure if it is even framed in this way in Latvia. It is, of course, for political language it is used but uh, i think in latvian society and in media discourse you never know it's not the dominant frame at least how ukrainian refugees are seen refugees is used uh, although in political language actually in all document language uh, they are called uh, ukrainian civilians even not refugees i'll come back to that 
they are not legally defined as refugees, but uh, there is a special law that is applied and they are seen as uh, Ukrainian civilians. That's the way how they are called, not uh, uh, refugees. Uh, we have currently, uh, of course, as everyone uh, uh, can guess, these all numbers are more estimation than actual numbers on the ground since there is back and forth migration, there is temporary uh, stay, and then, uh, you know, using Latvia as a, as a transit country for several weeks, staying there. Therefore, these numbers are relative. But currently, according to current official statistics, we can speak around 29,000 uh, civilians, Ukrainian refugees uh, residing in Latvia as registered, uh, so officially registered, who have an ID. Uh, and uh, and uh, from these uh, 29,000 uh, people, uh, 22, so 20, more than 22,000, 22.6 thousand uh, have received resident, uh, residence permit with rights to work. So meaning that these are not children, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, but there is around one third of all the of all the refugees are children from Ukraine. Uh, and um, by the way, actually, I checked uh, uh, preparing for this presentation for this discussion. I checked, and there are even twenty by twelfth of May. There were twenty seven babies born in Ukraine uh, from Ukraine uh, from Ukraine for, to Ukrainian women in Latvia. So even. Uh, some positive news in this uh, rather sad story, uh, but uh, yes, the, the the main factors the main factors are two actually. One is that uh, we uh, in Latvia kind of experience so, so to say a spillover effect, namely that part of refugees who initially come to Poland, cross Lithuania, and come to uh, come to Latvia for different reasons, but also for in terms of burden sharing, I guess, but all, so uh, just you know, uh, there are. Th this is a way how this is a, the, the 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 most typical route how Ukrainian refugees come to Latvia. But recently, over the last uh, weeks, particularly, and I think this is also related to the deportation of uh, Ukrainians from uh, eastern regions, particularly from Mariupol to Russia. There are uh, an increasing number of people who have come to Latvia through Estonia, crossing La Russian Estonian border and coming to Latvia. These are people who have really very traumatic experience, as you may uh, imagine, as they come from uh, really the most devastated uh, territories now. Uh, uh, but that's uh, really the, the, the latest trend. Um, uh, and the other, uh, other, other reason, other factor, of course, uh, is uh, relatives. Relatives. Uh, uh, Alexandra, or I think someone else before that mentioned uh, the, the diaspora uh, uh, in Poland. We do not have, of course, uh, in actual numbers as large diaspora, and also uh, in relative numbers, this is not as large as in Poland. But it was before that already around. 2% of all the Latvian population who identified, uh, maybe 2.5%, who identified as Ukrainians. So more or less they had some, some relatives uh, also in, in Ukraine. So from this also, uh, uh, this is one of the factors that uh, determines, uh, or friends also, but relatives largely, who come to Latvia. And actually, if we take into account the current number then, and if we believe these 29,000, that I could say that, uh, uh, that the share of Ukrainians in Latvia has doubled now, from 2% to 4% of all the population. So quite significant increase. Uh, yes, uh, totally, the Latvian government uh, uh, has declared that it's ready to admit 40,000 refugees. There is a special refugee admission plan adopted by the Latvian government and uh, 40,000 is uh, the, the number that that uh, that uh, it's not defined as some kind of you know quota but it, that's uh, the number that they they have said that the Latvian infrastructure would be able to uh, absorb 
in this in, in this situation. So if we have now twenty nine thousand, then ten more. Let's say eleven, maybe thousand, uh, and then maybe then then the challenge is going to increase, uh, perhaps. So in general, uh, Ukrainian civilians do, do not have to apply for the refugee status uh, uh, in Latvia, as I already told you, as there is a special law that promulgates uh, temporary protection of all the civilians who come to, to, to Latvia. So officially, legally, they are not seen as refugees, but with a special status, which uh, by and large uh, is a more, I would say, a legal thing uh, as a practical uh, rather than practical. But statistically, of course, you won't see these numbers uh, in refugee statistics, therefore, but in some other statistics. Uh, and, uh, and Ukrainians don't have to apply for a visa for the first 90 days uh, in Latvia, so the first months, uh, uh, first three months uh, uh, during their stay. And uh, uh, the majority, the more majority, and I think that might be, although maybe our, it is not different from from other from other countries uh, in our region, but the majority of all Ukrainian refugees uh, live uh, reside uh, in the capital, in Riga, or and in the other in other largest uh, Latvian cities. But it, this is also a Latvian policy uh, that. Uh, it is uh, organized in the way to, uh, to, 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 to direct refugees uh, proportionally to the number of residents in the declared municipality. So uh, that's the way how it, is, how it is planned, that not all refugees are, fo- are concentrating only in Riga, which could create, of course, uh, you know, a, a burden for one, for one municipality, too, too large burden. That's about policy planning, of course. And uh, according to the available, I, I checked yesterday, according to the uh, available vacancies, there is a Latvian, uh, uh, it's called the Employment Agency, the agency that is in charge of all the employment policy uh, in, in the country. Uh, and, and there is a special, uh, special um, uh, uh, search engine created for Ukrainian refugees, only vacancies for uh, Ukrainian refugees available. And I checked uh, on the map that all uh, the largest number, the, 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 the largest likelihood, so to say, to get a, a job uh, is in Riga or in the Riga agglomeration. So around maybe 60 kilometers, the largest cities around Riga, that's the place where uh, all the main vacancies are available. For, uh, so that's a hub of employment, so to say, for uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukraine refugees. But uh, having said that, it is estimated that around currently around fifty thousand persons uh, who have arrived from Ukraine are not fully able to apply for work because of maternity or some other things, also disability things uh, uh, or age, of course. Uh, so these factors, of course, constrain. Uh, 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 ability to apply, so uh, roughly half of, of all the of all those who have arrived, uh, or those who who more than half of all those who could be uh, who could uh, uh, work uh, for different reasons uh, can't uh, do that now currently. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I will come back, of course, when, in the next section when we will discuss. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, we'll discuss. Uh, Challenges. I think it's also very important to. I think already Marta, perhaps I think point, pointed to in her in her speech to to the problems with statistics and counting uh, and, and and measuring the actual numbers because we are of course trapped and we have to rely on statistics, which is a changing uh, almost day by day, uh, and we have simply have to rely. But in fact, we we really don't know, and it is a a very challenging for policymakers, particularly when they want to uh, plan uh, some long-term strategy. Uh, how many Ukrainians ha- have actually chosen to stay permanently, at least? Or by permanently, in these conditions, I mean at least for, for, for months, not for weeks, uh, in Latvia, uh, and use Latvia as, a, as asylum, so to say. And also... Uh, it is important, but at least I think it is not. Uh, it is not at this at this point uh, measured uh, who have come 
uh, from uh, they measure from which part, but it's uh, maybe not quite clear from uh, uh, who have come from the most, uh, so to say, destroyed or occupied territories uh, uh, of, 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 of Ukraine, which could suggest that they are also in more need, uh, those refugees, and also that they are, to some extent, uh, they uh, will inevitably will have uh, the, the objectively need to stay uh, for a longer period because all their houses are destroyed, all their uh, livelihood, everything is destroyed. Therefore, it's important also to know this, maybe not very, uh, this particular statistics is also very important in my opinion. So stat pro problems with statistics are obvious, uh, but I think they are general and, uh, and can be met elsewhere also, not only in Latvia. So I'll stop here and, and then we'll come back to challenges. Uh, thank you very much for uh, very interesting insights. And I don't know if you agree, because uh, you both mentioned that uh, some, some drivers, some factors why uh, Ukrainians uh, chose those countries to come. Uh, and I don't know if you if you uh, share my point of view. My point of view that both uh, Poland and Latvia were very. Uh, active and open to, especially especially at the beginning of, of uh, the invasion, and uh, both countries expressed uh, solidarity and uh, are, were very open for uh, for uh, Ukrainians uh, to support them. And um, uh, there is uh, uh, Martin uh, Martin uh, Rosumek is still absent, so I feel that uh, we uh, we have to go further. No, he's, here. he's here. He's here. Ah, he's yes. here. He's here. Yes, yes. Yeah, all, 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 all ah. the time. All the time. Ah, great, great. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us. So, uh, so the same question for you. Um, we start from uh, talking about directions and scale of uh, refugee flow from Ukraine. So. Uh, I, I feel that it is a great uh, moment to momentum for uh, focus on Czech Republic. So, Martin, floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry for being five minutes late. I could follow the whole discussion from the beginning, so that's that's fine. So, in the Czech Republic, uh, the response of the government and civil society and politicians was incredibly positive. I would never expect such a wave of solidarity after experiencing the so-called Syrian refugee crisis. It's changed for 180 degrees. F fantastic. And uh, even before the war, there were 200,000 Ukrainians living, working, studying in the Czech Republic. So it's, it's been pretty obvious that the newcomers would come and, uh, and many of them stay because many of them knew at the beginning that they are joining this and this relative or family or very, knew very well the place they are going to, to go. And we set up an operation in the main train station which was the main entry point for Ukrainians to in Prague, to the Czech Republic. Uh, through this period, we assisted more than 100,000 newcomers, helping them to find proper accommodation or connection, train, buses, etc., to other Czech or also, but also foreign cities. So many of them continued to, to other countries, but uh, majority of them, vast majority of them is still in the Czech Republic. Altogether, we registered as the Czech state 345,000 uh, temporary uh, protection permits for, for Ukrainians. 80% of them are women with smaller children. At the time being, uh, according to the Interior Minister Vitra Kushan, 200, more than 200 Ukrainians uh, still live in the Czech Republic. Approximately 140,000 uh, e either returned back to Ukraine or went to other, other <coughs> European countries. <coughs> Similar, like in At Latvia, Prague is overcrowded, uh, hosting maybe one-third of all Ukrainians living in the Czech Republic. 
our little advantage is that the Czech Republic has had the lowest unemployment in the EU, I think, last five years. So basically, everybody will find, in my opinion, everybody will find job because there is lack of all professions, all people in all professions. So full sectors of economy are dependent on Ukrainian hands, like construction work, tourist uh, industry. We, we can't simply live without the hands and brains of, of Ukrainians. So I guess that uh, many of them will stay because they will find easily jobs. Also, the language is similar. So we see already now that we run as, a, as an organization, a hotel for 250 Ukrainian refugees and many women work there. All children from the hotel are enrolled in schools. So it works quite well. And altogether, uh, already 40,000 Ukrainians, I mean, new Ukrainians, after coming after 24 February, found jobs already, which I think is a big success. There is a discussion how to uh, distribute the, the refugees better in the country, because still the main entry point or the main, main, main uh, place where refugees end up is, is Prague. So, Today, there should be a governmental session how to make it more, more better distributed. And uh, it seems that uh, we do have more capacities concerning flats or housing in general, doctors, school places, etc. in the eastern part of the country, in Moravia, and less in the western part of the country, in, in Prague, Plzeň, and uh, larger cities in the in the western part of the country. What I find difficult is for Ukrainians, but also for the empl employers, is that the government has not been able to say what will happen after the temporary protection is over. So when we search jobs with Ukrainians, very often the Ukrainians, but also the employers ask us Right, it's for 10 months, what will happen afterwards? And when I talk about it with the interior minister, he said that most likely the temporary protection will be prolonged for one year on the European level. But this uncertainty is difficult for many employers to offer, offer let's say, better contracts. So we do have a lot of Ukrainians employed on short-term basis, one-off contracts or totally without contract. And I think the Ministry of Labor feels that this is a problem because it could then make it more difficult for Czech unemployed persons to find jobs because this, let's say, precarious jobs should not become a norm for Ukrainians. So there is a lot of there are a lot of discussions on how to use the potential of Ukrainians who are who come educated with job careers from Ukraine and the only problem is language but I would say it's a small problem because the languages are similar and uh, I think after six months or one year you don't really see a big difference <laughs> also when it comes to, to, to language barrier. And one point I wanted to mention, yeah, uh, at the time being, we risk the, to lose the positive attitudes of the Czech society and politicians because we have to cope with a group of few thousand Roma refugees from, from Western Ukraine who, in my opinion, uh, were attracted by uh, the level of, uh, level of uh, social benefits that is higher than in Slovakia and what I heard even higher than in Germany. So we do have troubles when very large Roma families come to, to Prague and claim this, this amount of money 
in large numbers. And um, this is something that, of course, the ministry and the society doesn't like to see. But on the other hand, they come from Western Ukraine, so they are Ukrainians entitled to the temporary protection, but coming from the places where the war, where there was no war in, in the country of origin. So there are now big discussions how to somehow address this, this situation. And uh, we at the train station cope with uh, homeless Ukrainian Roma who sleep everywhere and receive more and more negative, negative attention from the Czech society. And this must be somehow solved. So otherwise, I think the Czech Republic did a good job. And I'm pretty surprised how well we managed to bring in 345,000 people. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you succeeded to join us. Uh, and you uh, mentioned some um, uh, some some um, uh, risky points uh, in your speech, and I think that it it is a good start for our next section, which will be uh, continued by Adam. Thank you very much, Ola, and thank you all of our panelists for joining us. Uh, and very interesting discussions that we have heard already uh, in the first half of this uh, of this panel, uh, primarily looking at uh, from the country's point of view uh, the refugee situation and understanding the scale and the dynamics of what's happening. Uh, but as as we have already started to mention, that there are a lot of challenges that that do uh, come with uh, with the refugee crisis. Uh, particularly looking at policies um, and how governments are managing the the, the challenge uh, of the of the large number of refugees, uh, but also societies uh, as as well. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, our panelists to look at what are some of the challenges uh, that their countries are facing, either from the governmental side or from the society side or both. Uh, and what challenges maybe we might expect even on the horizon, especially if we look at kind of the short, medium, and longer term uh, in, in, the, in the months, maybe we don't know how long this is going to last, maybe even a year or so ahead. Uh, so maybe if, if we could start uh, this round of questions maybe with, uh, with Poland, with Martha, uh, since uh, Poland is probably uh, facing, uh, if we look at the scale of the situation, is probably facing uh facing these challenges on the on the largest scale so Marta, i would like to hand the floor to you mm -hmm. thank you very much adam yes um um okay so what i mentioned at the beginning uh is i i would say that to like in poland after this 80 i don't remember 84 or 85 days of the war we could um uh, we could divide them into two phases the the first emergency phase and now we are more or less in stabilization phase right emergency phase when really i um, mean all the border crossing points were open and when the system start starting being uh, like put in place but the system was mainly because you know so many migrants accepted like uh, even up to 2 million in one month, it would mean that, of course, all the, uh, the the plans, the emergency governance plans that government had, they didn't work out, right? Because the plans were for, for 30,000, 40,000. So without the social solidarity, it wouldn't, wouldn't be possible to accept so many people, uh, so many people in the first month. So this first month, it was social solidarity. It was uh, un, like unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh unprecedented level of of uh, like uh, ngo movements uh, church movements uh, uh, and local authorities and also people uh, somebody even made i don't remember now the research that up to 2 million people were actively 2 million poles were actively assisting the refugees right 2, uh, two million people but uh, and, and and what the government gave the government kind of uh, 
prepared a chapeau, right, and uh, like legal basis, meaning that uh, that they uh, they they uh, they adopted the, the law that each Ukrainian who came after 24 February can stay legally in Poland for 18 months uh, upon simplified registration. They have access to social assistance, healthcare, labor market, education for children, right? But at this point. Uh, like and also they were uh, they they organized registration points they organized collective centers uh, for stay right but still but that's all meaning that that um, like uh, in terms of finances in terms of uh, so the people they, they they were waiting for the social uh, the people were waiting for the social assistance to come in private houses meaning that still 80 90 percent of the people are uh, remaining in the private houses so private people accepted the people accepted the, the refugees and 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 we were saying that it may not it may not last long right and and so because we are in stabilization phase we as researchers as civil society because like after one month two months i mean how long can you really live with uh, with other people right uh, how long can you host other people and uh, but still the solution was not found by the government to, to this problem, meaning that this law, so, so, okay, Poles uh, are given 40 slotties per day, right, of, of stay of, of those refugees to, uh, to cover the cost of their stay. And this law was extended for, for another few months. But, uh, but, um, I, I believe uh, it will be particularly hard now when the summer is coming because apart from private houses, these were also hotels. Else, or like generally all the touristic business accepted the migrants, the refugees. And now I'm afraid it, it will not, they will not, uh, I mean, we will not survive without a plan. And what should be the plan? The, the plan should be that uh, I, 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 when I was thinking of, of that and like not only me, but I think we should a little bit, uh, because this is really a challenge. Um, and it's obvious, like, uh, uh, you should remember that, for instance, Turkey also accepted like 5 million refugees, right? But they accepted them in like five years, right? Poland accepted 2 million people in one month. So, of course, it's a challenge, right? But still, there are some uh, countries that could be, that could be, uh, looked at. And I think Greece was such a, uh, such a Greece with the, with the really system of, um, lending houses, of social lending. I think this is the, this is the, this is where we should go in because nobody really wants collective camps, right, to be built in Poland. And I think we should really, uh, we should try to, to, uh, to avoid it. So really, what should be done because we don't have collective uh, we don't have information on the on the level of of the government how many people are staying where and what are really the the needs right and maybe the the local authorities for each like city or like especially smaller cities they know how many they collective uh, on the central level and i mean money should be given uh, should be given to to prepare really a all nation <laughs> lending scheme i think so this is one thing right because apartments are very important social social assistance this is another thing martin uh, was mentioning uh, the the czech social assistant poland maybe it's not so big uh because uh, because really two million people this is really a burden for the budget but still uh, there is some money this is a money right that people can at least like exist right they can survive but still uh, but still the issue is that uh, that some that people are waiting for for because there are such a long queues for the assistance to receive it for month or two and they really need they badly need cash they need cash now so like all the initiatives of humanitarian organizations donors to just you know provide people with cash for the first two three months before they will receive social assistance and before they will uh, for instance find jobs and now the issue of jobs in case of Poland, this is also 90% of, uh, of those people are women, right? And, uh, and, uh, and there are 700,000 children. And I am not, I am not, I am not so neoliberal in this sense that, you know, this, that, that those people really would need to find the job as quickly as possible. I think we really need, I mean, however, Poland has also a uh, small uh, unemployment and, and so on. They're, they're even, according to our Minister of Labor, six 
600,000 places, right? Uh, that people can be employed, but workplaces, but it's not so easy. I mean, it, it requires really structural change because uh, these were usually male jobs. And also the other thing is that these are divided families, meaning that only there is only mother, right? So who will stay with those children, right? I mean, it's not really 50s and the communistic times when women and the tractors were working and taking of children at the same time, right? I mean, it really, it's really a challenge. It requires uh, both the ministry, but also the, the employers and, and social services, really discussions, maybe half part, half jobs, half part time, right? I mean, these kind of solutions, elastic solutions, working at home and so on. I mean, uh, this is not really labor force, as like typical labor force, right? So it requires uh, time and it requires money. Okay, so my and my uh, so we need money. <laughs> we deadly need, need money because uh, perhaps everybody knows that Poland is still in the discussion with the European Commission or whether where where uh, this recovery and resilience plan for Poland will be adopted. And also uh, the, the Poland Polish government is saying that the like, commission should also find new money because the money that they are giving now, uh, is it's, this is money only for redirection, right? So there are two, um, uh, two ways, uh, either these are co cohesion funds, either these are the money, post-COVID money, yeah? They are called like post-COVID money, meaning that Pol Polish government could, could redirect unspent money for COVID related needs to refugees but the government is saying that it's not enough but uh, like i believe that it's not enough it's true but at the same time nobody really calculated how much we need and nobody really nobody really uh, pu publicly stated right because like we also as civil society and academia could be kind of involved right in the discussion but uh, nobody knows how much we need also because of the social solidarity movement for instance like my colleagues are saying who are working in the NGOs that um, nobody nobody really uh, uh, treat as a cost uh, food right like food that is given in the in the reception center because people are bringing food right for lady for three months but nobody calculated it. nobody calculated transport in the past because usually it was also a social movement that people uh, had free weekend and they uh, go to the they went to the border and bring people to other cities right but this is a cost as well right i mean so we what we are expecting from the government is that really assess the cost and tell us how much is needed right and also tell the commission how much is needed but i would say um it's not i mean it would require a lot of money i said as i said already i mean this is our moral obligation towards ukraine but i mean nobody should treat it as a really like labor force quickly adopt adopt adoptable right and okay and this is the, the my final comment would be children as i said 700,000 children, right? And this is really a challenge because this is really the global phenomenon. No uh, education system was uh, supposed to adopt, absorb so many children in, in such a short term. term. So, so for now, there are several um, ways to deal with that. So uh, even the Polish Ministry of Education is saying that it's not possible to absorb them like now, right? So uh, either so either they go to schools and for now around 200,000 children go to Polish schools, either they'll still remain in the Ukrainian education system, right? So meaning that they uh, they have uh, like online lessons, right? In the Ukrainian system. Either they do both, either they, they don't go anywhere, right? And now, I mean, now we have two months, now we have holidays to finally uh, decide what to do. I think, I mean, it should be, in my opinion, it should be so comprehensive, right? But uh, at the same time, I understand, and this is what Ukrainian authorities are asking, and I, I understand it as well, that uh, Ukrainian children should remain in the Polish, in the uh, Ukrainian education system, right? Because there is a lot of discussion about brain drain, about uh, like really keeping th those children I mean that allowing them to come back to Ukraine afterwards, and there is a there is a tension between uh, integration um, needs because I mean like how long can you really live in 
between in between right but on the on the one hand and the other hand of course the, these are refugees who if if they want who are who come from separated families and we understand it is very well and and this is also what martin capran said this is really temporary there are different shades of temporality right uh, that are really uh, shaping the whole movement and it's very difficult to manage because of that right because we don't know how it will finish and also uh, and this is the difference from european migration crisis of 2015 or 16 meaning that when for instance i don't know syrian refugees arrive in germany it took them three years and they knew what they wanted, right? So they knew, for instance, they wanted to stay in Germany. Majority of Ukrainians, they do not want to stay in Poland, yet there is, should be kind of consensus as for the everyday adaptation. I would call it everyday adaptation. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to, to, yeah, to stay in one society. I think I will stop here. Thank you, Martha, very much for those points. I think it also highlights just, as you mentioned, this uh, so many unknowns uh, that are there, and plus the, the unknown uh, overall uh, in terms of lack of understanding of the situation. It's very difficult to meet the challenges. We know the challenges that exist, but how to meet them because of these other unknowns is really, uh, really key. Um, thank you so much. I want to move now maybe to Latvia, uh, to Martins, and uh, get uh, his input on, you know, the, the looking at the challenges. Obviously, the, the scale and sheer numbers is, is much smaller, but you did mention in your opening uh, statement that, you know, uh, Ukrainians now make up around uh, three or four percent of the population. So at the same time, that is, that is still quite significant. So Martins, uh, I hand the floor now to you for, 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 your, for your input on the challenges. Yes, thank you. Um, perhaps many of these challenges are structural and can be can, are, are similar to uh, to other countries. Uh, but uh, I'll try maybe also to add some some uh, specific uh, Latvian specific problems. Uh, first thing is that uh, the Latvian government has allocated uh, now money, a special uh, amount. Uh, one more than 100 million euros uh, for from the state budget to 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 handle different uh, issues and challenges uh, related to Ukrainian Ukrainian refugees um, and uh, um, a large amount of this uh, is uh, is is envisaged to be uh, spent on 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 improving or renovating uh houses and living uh, so the, the house for living as uh, we really have a that's a really a, a challenge uh, i think marta mentioned something about uh, renting houses uh, or something like that in latvia it has been a structural problem for decades already the shortage of houses and that uh, of course is uh, particularly pronounced in riga where the largest part of Ukrainians uh, reside currently. Uh, it's a city where it has been for years uh, the shortage of, 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 of uh, finding house uh, and, 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 and housing people uh, in general. Uh, and now, of course, this pressure increases, not decreases. But also in other largest cities, uh, this, can, this problem can be observed. And therefore, uh, uh, the Ministry of, 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 of Regional Development in Latvia has uh, uh, surveyed, so to say, the potential real estate that can be renovated in a, in a relatively short period of time, namely this year, uh, to, to invest and renovate and, 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 and make accommodate these places for, for living. Uh, let's he ha let's see how it works. But of course, uh, these contentions. Uh, this is only solution. Uh, otherwise, you know, the current the current uh, premises are hostels, hotels, uh, and some other areas that uh, do not work for a long term period as a, as a, as a, as in terms of housing. These are short term solutions for short term problems. But you know, in a strategic way, it doesn't work for 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 this. For solving these problems, and and uh, three million of this money uh, of euros are are also allocated for lang language courses. Someone mentioned, I think, uh, 
Martin mentioned uh, uh, that uh, in terms of Czech Republic, uh, or now I should say also Czechia, uh, or Czech Republic, uh, it's, not, it's not such a problem to overcome this uh, boundary, language boundary, in a, in a relatively short period. That's a difference, uh, huge difference with Latvia, as Latvian language is absolutely new for Ukrainians who arrived to Latvia. And that creates problems for integration as well as also it creates, but maybe not so, uh, uh, so uh, tremendous uh, boundaries, but still boundaries in terms of labor market, uh, as uh, there are definitely some sectors in labor market where you can't simply work uh, if you do not uh, have uh, uh, the knowledge of Latin language. Uh, and this creates uh, objective boundaries, of course. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, I should admit that there is this money that has been allocated in Latvian budget uh, and it will be spent, I guess, in a proper way, uh, solving the mo most burning issues. Uh, housing is one of them, as, as I mentioned. Perhaps the, the, the most sensitive, not sensitive, but the most burning and the most pronounced. Um, uh, but uh, I think also it should should be ad admitted that uh, that uh, there is a a, a, a a noticeable network of charity organizations in Latvia that are in, are involved and engaged in, in helping refu uh, Ukrainian refugees to accommodate, uh, and they are distributed uh, or scattered all around Latvian territory. That's the difference, maybe that they are not only concentrated in Riga, but they are really in all the Latvian territory and they help to accommodate. Uh, but at the same time, speaking about challenges, we can observe, and this is a time, sentence, place against, uh, against us, that there is, against societal intentions to help, that we can observe over the last weeks, particularly a decreasing intensity of donations to these organizations. Activity is decreasing, it is declining, uh, and that's, to some extent, it's natural. You know, uh, there was this first kind of jump, you know, first mobilization of society and of civic society and of general society, and all these donations increased uh, over the first weeks rapidly, but now you can see a gradual decrease. And, of course, these NGOs signal about that, and they tell to government and to, to, to mass media there was one uh, 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 journalistic material on the, on the Sunday analytical program now in Latvia where they covered this problem of uh, NGOs that help the Ukrainian refugee that they are uh, out of uh, uh, or they face with a shortage of, uh, for example, food that they helped, you know, they, they collected food for Ukrainians uh, living in Latvia and there is uh, increasingly becoming a problem of, 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 of what to distribute, actually. There, there is a shortage of food. Uh, uh, so these practical problems uh, also touch uh, not only, you know, they touch also these charity organizations and they face with this. Uh, and this, it's, this will definitely be a problem that uh, 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 if we could see some kind of burden sharing within the first uh, months, uh, starting from February, then. Uh, now this burden kind of you know will be will be will move from NGOs to 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 to, to government to governmental institutions more than the, it was in April, for example, or even in yeah in, in March or April. Uh, yes, housing I already mentioned, and there is I think a rather although they, there is money for, for for solving this problem, I think there is still a rather vague vague. Uh, long-term strategy how to solve it and it's uh, really uh, let's see how it will be solved I think the, 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 the main issue or the main problem if I go through the policy documents or also you know how the government planned uh, how to solve this 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 uh, this uh, increasing uh, 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 number of uh, Ukrainian refugees is that uh, they too much relied on short-term strategy. If you read through, you know, different policy papers, they all usually focus on three months period. I mean, the documents which were adopted somewhere at the beginning of March. And it is, of course, natural. And I think it's, it's, it, we shouldn't be too critical towards government because 
everyone was in the in, in the you know in, in this was a time of a very ambiguous time no one knew no one could uh, guess how long uh, will be the war and uh, what will be the the the, the number of uh, refugees and therefore i think they will be, they were too optimistic actually if you look at this strategy they adopted in mars uh, it, it was too optimistic in my opinion uh, yes and education i think no one mentioned education but again in latvian case it uh, some problems arise because uh, one is of course linguistic boundary as uh, most of latvian schools uh, teach uh, the main language of instruction main language of teaching is latvian and for ukrainian kids it is uh, it is it is a definitely a problem to 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 you know to adopt particularly those for you know who want to for the, the for the secondary school not 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 such a problem for kindergartens i guess as kindergartens uh, is always you know very flexible i think uh, particularly in latvia but uh, on the other hand in, in in riga where the majority of ukrainians live we have a, a have have this special system of, of of minority schools first we have ukrainian school but of course it can cannot observe ob, ob, uh, absorb all the all the uh, children who come to to riga ukrainian children but still we have uh, what we call in latvia but this is more colloquial language russian language schools so uh, inherited from the soviet period so the schools where the main language of teaching was russian and uh, those children who come from eastern ukraine and who are uh, familiar or whose native language is actually a russian language for them obviously it's not such a problem but i think there are some psychological problems uh, as they come to schools uh, where they meet kids who sometimes uh, uh, represent or whose parents actually have uh, hold uh, anti or pro kremlin views and then these kids who come to these schools have to face with some you know uh, pupils who may sometimes uh, voice this uh, rather pro kremlin stances on what is happening on in ukraine so psychologically th this can create some problems therefore uh, i think uh, and i know that many not many but some uh, for this reason some parents decide to send their children to latvian schools which objectively is more complicated to them uh, but there, then there is also uh, a third uh, option uh, that there are some children who study uh, who have this distance learning so they still you know learn uh, study uh, or learn uh, in ukrainian schools being in latvia so this is a more complicated maybe than in, in poland or in, in, czech, in czech republic uh but i know from my daughter who is studying in a riga in riga, who is a, in a, a fifth grade in riga uh she has in her class two ukrainian kids one is from uh i think she is from Krivor, krivorog somewhere from the eastern ukraine and uh, and then there is a a, a a a boy from 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 kiev so uh, while boy has accommodated in a very very quickly I must admit this is a school where some subjects are taught in English language but it is a state funded school that it simply uh, has some specialization in English language uh, so for this uh, boy from Kiev he accommodated very quickly but for a girl who also has some traumatic uh, psychologically traumatic experience as she really experienced uh, um, maybe war more directly and the consequences of war the accommodation is not so so quick but uh, it's a good that uh, there are some uh, some uh, kids in at least for in my daughter's class from mixed families who can speak also russian so it is helpful and it helps uh, to to these kids to to uh, to accommodate in, in this latvian school um, so yes and fi finally uh, i want to uh, stress yes maybe that's maybe also difference between uh, Poland and Czech Republic uh, but I want to introduce also the role of public opinion in Latvia uh, uh, as someone already mentioned yes I I initially there were some measurements done in, in in March three quarters of Latvian society have supported the admission of Latvian uh, of uh, Ukrainian refugees so it's pretty pretty strong consensus uh, keeping in mind that Latvia is uh, ethnically quite divided society 
three quarters, 74 percent. So, uh, 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 and uh, also some half of Latvians have donated money to or other material values to Ukraine. These are representative uh, outcomes of representative surveys. But what we can observe, uh, maybe not, not so much, uh, I can uh, provide you evidences from surveys, but what we can observe on the everyday level uh, is attempts to radicalize the refugee issue in Latvian public opinion. Particularly if you go uh, 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 thoroughly through some, uh, you know, social networking sites, uh, uh, Russo, uh, Russian language social networking sites, you can observe how there are attempts to radicalize uh, Russophone milieu to take more critical attitude towards uh, Ukrainian refugees. Why the government is so uh, welcoming? Why do they provide so, so such benefits, so on and so forth? So playing, trying to you know to to pump up this kind of uh, uh, a sense of injustice, so to say. Why we are in unequal positions and why they deserve more than we? You know, playing with this very typical, sometimes anti-refugee claims that you can observe sometimes in different contexts. And also what is interesting, uh, some populist parties that we have elections this year, national elections in October, and some populist parties also try to draw on this uh, by, you know, claiming that why do we have so many uh, Ukrainian flags uh, all around the country? And why do we uh, help so much the Ukrainian refugees, but not to our local people? But these are not prevailing. These are not prevailing uh, opinions. Definitely, these are not. Op but I just want to outline uh, sources from where some uh, challenges and risks can increase over the next months to come. So with this maybe rather uh, cautious view on the future, I will leave the floor open. Maybe you have observed something similar in your society. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and uh, very interesting points as well. I'm, uh, I think we will be watching the, the electoral cycle quite closely to see if this is a possible uh, uh, factor yeah, in, in people's decisions. Um, and that I think, you know, could also then give some insight into other, other countries in the region who are facing similar issues. Uh, and you also mentioned, I think, and this is a, a very important uh, uh, point which I will now I would like to hand over the floor in a moment to Martin from 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 Czechia about uh, about this kind of fatigue in the society for support where you had in the beginning uh, you know people were coming out donating money donating food everything they could to support and now the NGOs who are responsible for collecting them are seeing it to much lower levels I think this is probably something that we see in a lot of countries and we will see even more. Uh, so, Martin, with that, let me hand over now to you for your, you had already discussed a few points on the challenges that the government and society faces, but maybe there are a couple more you still want to add, especially after hearing uh, the, the last two, two speakers. Thank you. I will be brief. It's true that uh, the solidarity of volunteers, private companies, private individuals basically saved the situation for two first two months. Still, OPU being the largest refugee assisting NGO in the Czech Republic has not received one single Czech crown from the state budget to cope with, uh, with uh, the situation. So without volunteers, private companies and individuals, accommodation, social services, nothing would work. And we see that this solidarity is not endless. Uh, we see we now we miss 80% of the volunteers we need in the train station. Similar in the hotel, we operate or we run a hotel for 280 uh, Ukrainian refugees and uh, the lack of volunteers creates already troubles. And uh, similar with financial support, that uh, first one month was full of donation offers and, uh, and donations received, and now almost nothing. So this is a big problem, and uh, I'm afraid that this 
high media attention to the issue of Roma refugees uh, at the train station and in Prague could mean an end to the solidarity of Czech citizens uh, for for a long time with uh, with refugees from Ukraine. Hopefully not, because we see that these let's say two hundred thousand. Uh, Ukrainians in the Czech Republic are treated well, integrate well, uh, interact with the Czech citizens everywhere. In every small village, you have Ukrainian Ukrainians registered under the temporary protection regime. So I hope that this positive attitude of personal experience with refugees will still keep some level of solidarity. But I'm really not sure about it. And I think for us a big challenge will be accommodation because there is a system uh, according to which uh, every private owner of house and flat should receive some 140 euro monthly or 130 euros monthly for every single person accommodated. And if it's a large hotel, then there is another system which in on paper is very generous, but in practice doesn't work very well. So I think the only cash the state gave was the cash to for for the refugees themselves, but not really for the for the housing owners, which is a big problem because when you look at Prague now, it's more and more full of tourists. And I'm very afraid that we that the hotel and hostel owners will lose their patience with with being not paid for two months for the services they delivered. So this is my main worry that there will be a lot of Ukrainians searching for new accommodation. On the other hand, we are not happy that they shouldn't, in my opinion, live in hostels or hotels for forever. So I think it uh, it uh, would require maybe to look at the or to damage the Airbnb system in the Czech Republic because there are a lot of flats that were rented under Airbnb and and I think it's a big discussion how to make it attractive for private flat and house owners to have. Ukrainian refugees as normal tenants, let's say. I think this would be important, but I'm afraid that as everything is slow, the state reacts slowly, that we might have a lot of Ukrainians on the street because uh, the hotel owners will not sponsor this operation forever. Uh, so that's my main worry. Otherwise, I think we cope quite well. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Martin. And uh, certainly some some uh, similarities to the to the challenges facing. I think, in particular, accommodation, as you mentioned, I think is uh, something that all of the the countries are going to have to manage. But as you mentioned, also because of the summer is coming, so the 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 um, hospitality industry is uh, looking to make profits. So this is going to be a big challenge. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so for the last uh, last voice in our panel, I wanted to now hand it back to Alexei, who's going to talk a little bit about from the Ukrainian perspective the challenges that are that are faced uh, because of this massive uh, migration, the refugees uh, in different countries, um, internally and externally. Uh, Alexei, um, I hand it to you. Thank you. In general, if you. Uh, thinking about possibility to solve a problem like humanitarian problem and in general problem uh, and trying to predict how situation will develop. Uh, we are coming to very simple like answer. So everything will depends how situation on battlefield will develop in Ukraine and actually when war will finish. So uh, paradoxically, but the best humanitarian solution and best help uh, with refugee, it's uh, just help Ukraine to defeat Russians on the battlefield. So unfortunately, the main and best humanitarian help is heavy artillery and heavy ammunition for Ukraine. So what we can actually predict at least for a 
possible uh, future, how it can develop. Uh, in, I am not talking about like end of war, it's another topic, but I mean in the sense of uh, potential behavior of Ukrainian refugees and in general the strategy of uh, European countries, how to deal with it. So most probably uh, the situation would not be solved very quickly. So it means like uh, we should think about possibility that uh, many millions of Ukrainians would stay in Europe at least for months. I am not talking about uh, long longer term perspective and personally I hope that Ukraine would defeat Russia much sooner. But in general, yes, uh, we have uh, many challenges which are already not initial uh, like uh, stage, as Marta already told, but the stage of stabilization. So we explore many things about ourselves during those three months. One of them, like for Ukrainians, I suppose, uh, one of the challenge and uh, point of uh, exception, it should be that situation would not come back as it was in February. Even if we would imagine that war will finish tomorrow, actually we will not come back to the world as it was. And in Europe as well. It doesn't mean it's only a question of Ukrainian refugees. It's a much more wider perspective of challenges which you, uh, Europe would face. And Ukrainians, it's probably maybe the not last, but maybe the least problem for Europe in general. But anyway, it would require some steps, including the changes in the policy of European Union, it's uh, visible is that uh, Central European countries need support in the dealing with uh, Ukrainians uh, on their ter in their territories. But also it requires some changes in the general approaches towards many aspects. But also what we explore also, as uh, you all mentioned before, and I would uh, really pick up it once more and not once more, that we could observe enormous support from a societies of accepting countries. So it was also probably one of the points which probably would be difficult to imagine a few months ago that societies of Central European countries and other countries would be ready for so enormous support. And also, it, I suppose it transforms society because this type of solidarity, this type of self-organization, it's also resulted in certain changes in the society on a general level. If you're talking about challenges, so, well, one of the biggest challenges it would be kind of this help integration because uh, also there is difficult to build policy if we don't know for how long should we build this policy? Because in general, I suppose, majority of Ukrainians would come back to Ukraine if any possibility would be open for them. So it means a majority of uh, Ukrainians who are staying uh, now in Europe, they're not really building their perspective for, let's say, long-term perspective, etc., etc but they are trying to adapt themselves to the situation. What we can observe as a general trend, so uh, Ukrainians in general, they are not behave themselves as a, like typical refugees, and also it's a difficult, uh, different status, so temporary protection allows people to work. Uh, as we can see, for example, official data, like in uh, Poland, uh, 400,000 uh, people received passage, so it's already uh, uh, gives them possibility to access to a job market, and more than 100,000 of people already officially works. So I suppose these numbers would just increase, and uh, probably in other countries, especially in the countries like of Central Europe, situation will be very similar. As already mentioned by many panelists, we have proximity in the languages, in the culture, and in general, the strategy of behavior of uh, Ukrainians who are now in Europe, 
it's rather uh, to try to solve situation not relying on the government but just trying to uh, build their networking and also looking for a job so in general it also gives like in any situation we have negative aspect but uh, some positive aspects as well because in many countries ukrainians would deliver significant positive effect on the labor market and in general for economy uh it's big question of course uh, how much would cost for uh, countries support of ukrainians but also in the long term perspective the potential impact of ukrainians on the job market and uh, in general receiving society would be much more positive than maybe expenses which are now carried by governments Uh, if you will look on estimations for example golden sachs bank uh, estimated that uh, four of the biggest countries in europe would spend near 0.2% of uh, gdp on the ukrainian related uh, issues including like support of refugees and other programs so it's not big money in general Uh, for example all the expenses w- which are connected with the war it's uh, according to their estimations it's more than 1% so the refugees itself it's not the biggest problem but of course for society especially for certain countries for certain cities maybe even it can be a really big challenge how to adapt like in warsaw there are 300,000 of ukrainians who are just newcomers and of course it's huge pressure pressure on uh, not on the labor market but first of all a uh, question of housing infrastructure etc etc so whose problems would appear uh, we would ne- like need to solve this situation in the at least short term perspective uh, i suppose in general uh, people would adapt themselves mainly using the previous experience of adaptation so it's just uh, relying on networking relying or independent income and renting apartments uh, for money as well and more or less as we can see this uh, was free months show us that in general receiving countries and also ukrainian uh, refugees were quite ready to solve uh, this situation somehow of course there is a question how uh, we can use this possibility in the best way how european countries which received so many uh, and in ma- mainly it's really uh, people who have education who have very good Uh, abilities uh, to deliver something to the country so how they could use this potential from one hand and for ukraine unfortunately of course the question of like brain washing and uh, like brain drowning uh, draining sorry uh, it's also a big question because uh, yes many people especially from uh, the group of most active like a uh, mobile group who could easily adapt who have already for example job for example we have a lot of people who are working remotely like people from IT industry they can adapt themselves much easy and in general for ukraine it would be really big challenge and potential problem in the sense of economy how to attract those people back for people who are less able to adapt who are uh, who had no for example uh, previous experience of mobility and as we know for example many people from eastern part of ukraine who moved now they had traditionally uh, a less experience of mobility and it requires from one hand uh, psychological adaptations but from other hand uh, most probably people with uh, less uh, previous mo- uh, experience of mobility would tend to come back to ukraine more than more mobile more active parts of society so all these questions actually i don't think that we have answers i suppose uh, in general we would react as it is so it's mean like uh, adaptation to, uh, uh, according to the situation i hope that in general 
situation in Ukraine would be solved, I mean, in the nearest perspective, at least uh, in the nearest months. And it would really attract majority of people to, uh, back to Ukraine. But another challenge would be not only for Ukraine, but again, for uh, at least neighboring countries, how to support those people who would come back to Ukraine, but they would not uh, come back to their uh, like uh, place where they came. So in eastern part of Ukraine, probably in certain part of southern part of Ukraine, and especially in the destroying cities like Mariupol, uh, we could e expect that majority of people would not come back at least in the nearest future, because actually there is no infrastructure, there is no job, there is no houses. So people would uh, probably try to re-establish their life in other regions of Ukraine. And according to the opinion polls, which was made uh, recently, actually it's a significant number of people. At least 25% of people would definitely change their place of uh, living in Ukraine. But uh, the question of uh, destruction of other cities would probably increase this number significantly. So Ukraine would require support in the sense of uh, rebuilding, uh, construction of new houses, maybe even new infrastructure in other regions. Also, it's open possibilities, actually, let's say openly. It's open possibilities for European countries to come to Ukrainian markets to deliver not only aid, but also uh, actually open the lines for a business, etc., etc. So we need to think for the situation from very different perspectives. But unfortunately, the main question is still under, uh, like, uh, it's not solved, and I would not really uh, wait, uh, like, really solving problem in the nearest future in the sense of challenges and problems which Russia would create, not only in Ukraine, but in other countries. So in general, we are coming back to the main questions, what to deal with, what to do with Russia and how to deal with Putin's regime. So here probably I will stop because it's already a topic for another. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alexa, very much uh, for your uh, very important insights. And I think, uh, yes, uh, you highlighted just uh, the the importance of uh, the, the unknown factors and uh, um, how Ukrainians will decide to to um, come back or not or where to go. Uh, there's so many questions still that remain. And I do agree with you that, you know, the best way to end this whole situation would be to, to end the war with Russia, uh, with Ukraine's victory, of course. Um, but we don't know how and when that will, will take place. Um, so I, we've already have gone a little bit over our time uh, for our panel. I just want, to, before I hand it back uh, over to Ola, I just want to thank all of our panelists from, on, on my behalf uh, for your inputs. Um, I think uh, it was Alexis, but a few others maybe who mentioned that, you know, out of a negative situation, there are still some positives and it's also worth looking at uh, some of the positive things that have come out and clearly the solidarity uh, that our countries have shown with the Ukrainians uh, welcoming in these during these very difficult times is one of the main uh, main positives of that as well. So thank you once again, and Ola, I, I hand the floor for your for your final words uh, to close out our panel. Uh, thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, yes, I, I do agree that it was excellent discussion, and uh, uh, as uh, as a chair, I would like to thank you all uh, for for taking part in uh, the in our uh, debate, and I hope and I feel that it was only our face, uh, our first uh, stage, our first step to continue this uh, uh, this discussion, and I hope that we can uh, meet together and and once more and uh, continue that. So thank you, thank you very much, thank you for participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. It is time to close our Lublin Central Europe Forum 2022. Yesterday and today, 
We had immensely absorbing discussions during three panels with the leading theme of Central Europe, a shift in the security paradigm. On behalf of the Institute of Central Europe, I would like to extend a warm thank you uh, to all participating institutions and speakers from Central Europe, from Eastern Europe and from the Balkans. This year, the forum was organized in a hybrid format. However, I do hope that next year we will meet in Lublin in person to discuss matters concerning Central Europe. Thank you very much and see you next year in Lublin. Goodbye.